Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have with us Cannondale and Trainer Road's Amber Pierce. Good morning. And hand up plus the Black Bibs Racing's Ivy Audrain. Hey, how's it going? And our CEO, hey, what's up? And our CEO, Nate Pearson. Your hair looks fantastic today, Nate. No, it doesn't. It looks crunchy because I just got out of the shower and I rushed. <laughs> I was very, like uh, it was very close. You like the crunch. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it looks good. Yeah. If you want to see Nate's hair, you can join us on YouTube. It's at 8 a.m. on Thursdays and for the live stream. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on the live stream and for joining right now. Thumbs up. Share this podcast with your friends. Uh, let's get into a handful of things. First, a correction about last week. I mentioned the oft-mentioned study about shining an LED on the back of a person's knee uh, when they were sleeping and showing that that disrupted sleep in a certain level. Um, then we also, we had somebody on the forum point out that like, Hey, that study had been refuted. Uh, different researchers had tried to replicate the findings and they couldn't replicate them. Uh, so, uh, we want to clarify that. So basically, uh, this, uh, there was a study flaw, a pretty significant one that was causing that one to be misunderstood. Uh, there's, they we're uh, talking, this... we're shining the light on your leg. We're shining the light on your leg. <laughs> Honestly, Nate, it's yeah. not far off from that. So they had a TV on and the TV had volume on. They had that to try to stop them from going to sleep while they were doing this thing. And they left it on while they were sleeping. So then as a result, like, of course, you're not going to sleep well if you have TV talking uh, going on while you're trying to sleep. Pretty like large oversight, you'd think, right? Uh, yeah. Based on some people, scientists I've talked to and my sister, who's a PhD researcher, like PhDs, there's like, they're either like geniuses or you're like, what are you thinking? Like all of us would be like, why would we leave a TV on during a sleep study? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It goes, it goes either way. Amber, did you get that experience too? Like it's, there's not many people in the middle. They kind of go either way. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, most people are on the one side of the genius, but yeah. <laughs> no, Amber's not going to name the people yeah, that you Amber. thought were bad. <laughs> she says no comments. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with uh, the fifth on that one. <laughs> and, yeah. and two, and, and other things like scientists can disagree and move forward. And be like, oh, I didn't think of that. But there's some things that are just silly. Uh, you know, yeah, this is another example of the thing where a lot of the time we just take science, uh, the accuracy of science for granted, where we just, well, it's published or it's a paper and I can read it in the abstract, therefore it's true. And boy, going back to when we talked about all the, all the uh, research that's out there on the polarized studies and everything else, you know, it's really, you have to go deeper than just an abstract. You really have to look mm -hmm. into everything uh, that goes into it. That's Next what- Next time, trainer roads. Critical media <clears throat> literacy courses, masterclass. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Top no, you're, you're absolutely right. Lots of money has been made about like, there's two ways. Sometimes people misrepresent studies, uh, either knowingly or unknowingly. And other times, uh, like you said, that they, they could just be refuted later. So it's, and other times it's just the science, like someone goes, oh, what if we test this with it? And they remove a variable or add a variable or something like that. And they learn something else. So it's really, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's, it's, that's why it's ever changing, right? We might think one thing at, at a moment and then later on, we think something else because we have new evidence. Mm -hmm. And how often yeah, do the science, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Amber. Oh, just saying it's iterative. So, you know, it's, it's, we do the best we can with the information we have at the time. And that's just how science works, which is exciting because there's a lot to learn. Um, but it also requires that you really think through critically about what you're reading and whether intentional or innocent, how many times do we average people, uh, look at a study and then think that, okay, they proved this one point therefore, and we make a logic leap. And then right in doing that, I bet if we were talking to the researcher about it, they'd be like, no, don't do that. Don't take a logic. Yeah. Leap. I just proved this very thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't prove anything else. I just, we just looked at this very thing, you know? That's what we actually did in the science of getting faster is specifically asked, what does this not say? Because that is uh, what, like, might you think of this? And then what does it actually not say of that? Because yeah, what you just said, it happens all the time. And it's so easy to do the transitive property in science, but like A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. And sometimes you can, but a lot of, like scientists like prove that B, that A equals C, right? In that situation, they don't assume that it does because there's other stuff that happens. It's not math. There's lots of things that happen in between there. Well, sometimes it is math, but if it's, uh, <laughs> if it's like exercise physiology or, um, psychology or something like that, uh, nutrition, we don't know like anything with the body. It's crazy how much we don't know still <laughs> yeah. about the body, which is insane, insane yeah. for how advanced we are for going to the moon and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't know that. So complex. Bodies are amazing. <laughs> TM. 
Amber Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, and we're working on more science I, of getting faster episodes. I feel, I feel like Amber be. is like hyping her body up, like, so it, she lives longer. <laughs> She's always like, you're amazing. I love you. Like, I think I'll stay around. She's not so bad. Uh, I'm just, not going to get you sick. Life. Don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. They're best friends. You can't hurt, right? Yeah, hurt. Positive self-talk. Uh, we're going to have more Science of Getting Faster episodes coming as well. We're working on that as we speak. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be working on that. Now, Nate, this section's for you <clears throat> from Brian. He says, not so much a question. Just want to give Nate an opening to say, quote, I told you so about the use of dropper posts in road racing, follow, following uh, Mate Mihorix. And I, I know I have butchered that name. It's Slovenian. And believe it or not, I'm not from Slovenia. I have no clue how to pronounce the names. Um, it'd probably be worse if I tried really hard. But he's mentioning his scary descent in the Milan San Remo. We didn't talk about this until now because I wanted to wait until Nate was on. Nate? The floor is yours. Okay. Here's what happened. What, when was this? Like 2015, 2016? 2015, Sean? I think. It yeah. might have been 16, I, but I think it was 15. I was like, we need dropper posts on, on road bikes because descending, just what you said, and cornering, you can go. It feels so much better when you drop. And I had, I'd put dropper bikes on like a cross bike and do it outside. And that felt amazing. Uh, so many people told me how wrong I was and how that weight <laughs> difference was going to be like the issue. And I think this is, there is something in cycling with us men do it, where if we feel like it's like anything with macho or ego, like you should just descend, like take the fear out of it. You should just be able to descend better when, uh, but you've seen this, right? Like everyone with men doing this in all aspects of life. Um, we don't look at the most logical thing because we think that it might uh, hurt our masculinity by having a dropper post. Uh, you don't need it. It happened in mountain bikes, right? I don't need, it was like a Yep. John, correct me if I'm wrong, but for a long time, it was a badge of courage or badge of honor. I have, you tell me too, uh, it's going to be dropped for post and cross for a lot more. into this, man. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hot waters. <laughs> About to get dragged. But it was oh, a badge of honor. Yeah, go ahead. It would be sick to have droppers in cycle cross and I'll probably get dragged for that too. But damn, there are definitely some features that are like so steep and weird and like slow speed that your saddle's like on your stomach because you're trying to like get your weight back and it's weird and hell yeah, the dropper would be sick in cycle cross. Mm -hmm. I, I use it and so yeah, what happens in cross, you like, it's the steepest hills you ever do sometimes, even steeper than like <laughs> maybe like downhill mountain bike and it's short and there's usually a turn at the bottom, right? Cause they like to like mess with you. And if you could and it's get, slick and, then, and it's off camber and it's like, <laughs> I know, but my point is with John with mountain biking for so many years, it was a badge of honor. People would be like, I don't need a dropper. Uh -huh. Right. Totally. Like I, I don't need it. It's not needed for me because I am a good bike handler. I have skill. Therefore I don't need it. When mm -hmm. now you see the best in the world, right. Mm -hmm. They are using it because it actually there's physics behind it and they actually go faster. Same thing with arrow stuff, like, uh, arrow bars. There's so many things over the years that, uh, wider tires, people like, I don't need wider tires. It's going to be, you know, it's, it's bigger. They're, it's very annoying in general, but, uh, don't need water. You gotta, it's like a good, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, say it. yeah. There's carbs too. People are like, I don't need to eat. I'm yep. so proud of myself for not eating on this ride and doing this sort of stuff. Uh, because it seems like I am so tough. I don't need to eat, but anyways, mm -hmm. that's a big thing. I'm sure it happens in other aspects of my life where I am not aware of it. Uh, all three of you probably are like, you do it all the time. You just don't know. But <laughs> we all do to some degree though. We all do in different aspects. It, yeah. Everybody has an ego, right? And you can never get rid of it. And uh, unless you do some crazy drugs, it's only for a little bit. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it, it, just to try to be aware of it. Anyways, yes, dropper bikes and road bikes. I hope they start specking road bikes now with dropper posts so that yeah. they're, they're built in really easily and everyone can use them and uh, have an amazing time. Yeah. And I'm sure, and everyone's like, well, what are you going to do with like arrow seat posts? They'll figure out a way, or they'll have a shim in place that lets you put a dropper post in there. That's what a lot of mountain yeah. bike companies are doing now. So it's like th they can make the tube shape, whatever it is. And they just have a shim that allows you to run a dropper post in there. I think that's how Mahorich's uh, bike was set up. So uh, Nate, I wanted to share something on this. So last night I did a short track race, got destroyed by our local juniors. Again, they're so fast. Um, but in that course, we had a pretty big drop. There was an A line and a B line and there was a big drop and I didn't have a dropper on because I haven't put my dropper back on. And I like to run my tail light because I ride my road bike on the road. I like to run my tail light really high. So it's more visible. I don't like strapping it on the stanchion of my dropper post. Right. So 
Um, <clears throat> and I run the Varia radar thing up there. So I've just been running the high post. I didn't switch it out because last time the course was really like non-technical. This time it wasn't the drop, but it was the slow turns like you're talking about with cyclocross and with Ivy. I think I bled a lot of time there. I just had time that I could have made up if I would have had a dropper because it just allows you to lower your center of gravity and decouple more from the bike. And, and a lot of people are talking about how like droppers are for only one specific scenario, but their benefits are wide ranging and they may benefit one person very differently than they benefit another person because their bodies are so different. Like some athletes, like I think of like a Caleb Ewan who has short legs. And as a result, when he's sprinting, I bet that he could even sprint better if he dropped his saddle first. And nobody's talking about that, but I guarantee you, he could have a way better sprint if he dropped his saddle. Um, that it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Like it just opens up a whole wave of different things. And the other thing I want to say about this specific descent is that everyone was like, oh, his descent was like extra, or he won the race because of the dropper post. He is an incredible descender. He's shown that before. I think without a dropper post, he would have won. But the thing is the dropper allowed him to have a bit more comfort. And everyone talks about like the two sketchy moments that he had. He might not have saved those if he didn't have the dropper for sure. Um, but I don't think the dropper was getting him into trouble. I don't think it even necessarily like enabled like a, a higher speed. It, like a lot of the time when we talk about it with cycling, your goal is just to lower your RPE. It isn't necessarily to like raise your power, but if you can lower your RPE at the same power, that's a win. And with descending, if you can lower your RPE or rate of perceived danger, whatever it might be, uh, rate of perceived fear <laughs> when you're going downhill, that's a huge win because it's going to make you more adaptable and able to react to things. So he probably would have won if that guy had an extra high post. He's just so good at descending, but maybe, but the dropper post does make it so you can take like more pressure into the terms because the turns, because mm -hmm. the force going down is like, it's a little different than when you're high up. The other thing in the UCI, you can't super tuck anymore. And having that lower, be able to tuck is an error advantage when you're descending. And you've seen someone probably you're descending and one person just like drops down a little more. Mm -hmm. And they start pulling away from you. And when you're descending solo and you have a dropper post and you can take a little bit more of aerodynamic drag from there, you're gaining seconds all the time over people, people who can't get that low because they don't have a dropper. And doing it safely because when you lay down on the top tube, you have no way to control your bike. But if your pelvis is still on a saddle, it's just lower. You can still control it. Actually going down straight, it feels even safer because you can like lock it in and you're like part of the bike rather than really high, uh, you know, might drop. I have this much seat post for showing yeah, like, especially for you being so tall or Amber, like compared to the rest of the racers you were with, like you, you probably rarely got a draft, <laughs> like your handlebars got a draft and that's it. Right. So yeah, and this is the, more, go ahead. Ivy. Oh, this is more like off-road specific, but don't y'all use it sometimes when you're climbing too, like when it's super technical and like yes. super steep and you need to just drop it just like a couple inches and it helps so much. I bet in the yep. cobbles and stuff, a Amber, like I bet that could even, if it's like really rough, that might even be helpful, even though they're not big yeah. bumps, but because it's traction is the limiter, right? Where like you're trying to pedal really hard, but then if you get sloppy with your technique or anything, you lose traction and then you're really done. And that's yep. what those lo slightly lower seat can really help with. What happens in cyclocross is uh, a teeny, teeny drop because you float right through like sand. You want to mm -hmm. float through there. Ivy, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, same thing with cobbles, you, a little bit of float and you can have, it's like extra suspension inside of it. Um, the other thing is that when I look at it and you, you might think this is not a thing for me, but look at the difference in drop between your, your saddle and your handlebars. Uh, that can give you kind of an idea of how like you're weighted on the bike. And some people I see them, they're exactly the same. And like, on, I get like 180 millimeters of drop and I'm still higher, but in the pro field, they usually ride uh, smaller frames and uh, at least in the men's pro and they have like way, they have a huge drop inside of there. So the ability to get really close to like, mm, I don't know what the word is for it, but uh, bike center of gravity, I guess, uh, to, to, to lower that would be uh, amazing. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Amber, as a athlete who's raced in the pro Peloton and done all this stuff? Oh yeah. I think there's a lot of uses for this. It's, it's going to be really exciting to see um, how it can change things. Cause as you said, people are, extraordinarily skilled without it but then when you add another tool to the toolbox for somebody who's already skilled at using all of those tools it's kind of exciting to see what can happen mm -hmm. yeah and more i just love this so there's so many people y'all are like very amazing road like descenders and and all that for road like honestly like 
some of the best nation, right? Like in US, if not world class, like Amber, you're obviously world class on that. So many more people are like me, where it starts going 35, 40, 45 miles per hour. And you're like, this is really scary. And this can be a part of cycling that I used to dread, 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 where we have big hills in here. I love the climb. And I'm like, oh gosh, I have a 45 minute descent, not 45 minute, 20 minute descent. That's going to go really fast. Having a dropper post, I, I'm telling you, everyone on a road bike makes you like, makes me from being uncomfortable and not liking it to, wow, I feel so safe and secure. It feels like you're going slower and, uh, having access to this on road bikes can make cycling so much more fun. And even if you said, I'm not going to use it in a race ever, uh, for some weight issue, use it in every day of training. Like, and you say, oh, I'm not going to descend as well, but I don't know. You can maybe in a crit, you don't need a dropper post if the sprint's not to John's point, but for everything else, if you're uh, riding, that'd be awesome. The other thing, John, I'm going to grind my gears a little bit, uh, <laughs> disc brakes. I've been yes. saying disc brakes for years about, we should have disc brakes on road bikes. There was a post on slow twitch where I said, we need disc brakes on TT bikes because TT bikes descend and stuff. People flame me. It's still there from like 2013 about that's never going to happen. <laughs> all this sort of stuff it's not arrow why would you I um, when, the, have any of those people use like 2013 generation of like tt brakes oh just like oh do that's not terrifying work. they just <laughs> make noise <laughs> you don't slow down they just make noise one of the it's top the posters on slow twitch was like why would you ever need to like you're why would i need to break in a tt that is like not i know exactly uh, there's some triathlons where you do one when turn, you need right? it, you kind of need it, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you do kind of need, need it. You really need it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but now we're like, no one would buy a bike without, well, some people would, but in general, buying a bike that's not disc brakes seems not like the right choice now. And yep. I think dropper posts are going to be the same way in the future as bikes get lighter too. And like, it's, it's going to be a thing for everybody. And then cross is going to be next cross. I'm surprised some people do it in cross actually, but cross should have been, uh, before, uh -huh before road and then gravel too it. here we go descending on <laughs> yes, <Ivy. laughs> descending on a, a gravel fire road like with the dropper oh, it, yeah it, like if you feel so much better because that's slippery it's the same issue with road except it's slippery when you're going on the on the corners you want to have a low center of gravity i have kind of yeah. like a theory with this where it's like if the bike is more limiting through like geometry in particular then i want a dropper so then i can alter that geometry to whatever I need and I can get out of the mm. bad position it puts me on. So like, that's a good idea. even though this sounds silly, I kind of rather have a dropper. If I had to pick and choose and I could only have one bike with a dropper post and I had an enduro bike. And then I also had a cyclocross bike. It would actually be a toss up as weird as that sounds to me, because even though I'm probably riding really gnarly terrain on the enduro bike, that huge suspension and the really slack geometry and everything else probably gives me a big level of wiggle room. And the cyclocross bike just gives me zero wiggle room, right? It's just me in the terrain and I might be able to go faster. So it's like, think about it. If your bike is limiting you more, why not enable it? Right. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say it one way. more way. Your the optimal climbing position is never the optimal descending position ever. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the same. And yep. there's sometimes you're not limited where you're going on 2% down grade or something, but other times you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all of this comes back to. I'll, you know, regardless of what level you're at, there is an opportunity to learn and become more skilled on the bike. And when you think about what facilitates learning, it's you can't just do the things that you already know because that's inside your comfort zone. But the further outside your comfort zone, you kind of get on the seesaw where on one side you have control and on the other side you have fear. So as control goes up, fear comes down and you want to find the right balance of that because just getting just far enough beyond your comfort zone to where you are learning, but you have enough control to keep that fear low enough so that your brain is not going into survival mode and can learn things. So if you can, if you have access to tools like these, it can be really, really helpful because it can create more space beyond your comfort zone in which you can be learning um, and honing new skills without having that freak out fight or flight reaction from your brain. And it's just about, it's just about that seesaw of control and fear and finding the right balance there so that you can stay in the learning zone. Um, it's not like you don't have to have disc brakes or have to have a dropper post to find that, that happy medium, but these are tools that can help expand it a little bit. I, I would be happy, Amber, for the rest of my life, not to be in that learning zone ever again and just be in the comfort, <laughs> high control. I mean, it's just, it is fun to be super high control too. The, the, I know what your point is, but to everyone else, if uh, 
you don't have to, as I've thought this before in mountain biking, I don't always have to be in that uncomfortable zone of where I'm no. learning. Sometimes you could just be in like, well, honestly, learning like doesn't have to be uncomfortable. Absolutely not. Yeah. Or and, even and in the learning important. zone at all. Yeah. You can I'm just sorry. have fun sitting below the learning zone. It's still yeah, a blast. Doing what you do best. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that, uh, Lee McCormick where there's the, uh, what he says, like a seven and eight in arousal zone. That's where you want to be. Yeah. And I kind of chased that for a long time, but man, sometimes riding and just being in the twos and threes and you're like, woo, it's fun. Woo. and there's yeah, no you're like, on autopilot. It's great. Yeah. That's what yeah, I like what's, too. Yeah. What's a level two for you is not going to be a level two for somebody else. And it's super important mm-hmm. to recognize that, you know, mm-hmm. and to give everybody the space. Love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Um, Nate, we have a bunch of topics that I want to, that we've covered recently that I want to talk to you about. We also okay. have some listener questions. And then I also want to talk about host challenges because it's been a while since we've done one. I mean, last one was Cape Epic. Uh, that one shifted for a number of different reasons, but it was amazing. Uh, Nate, you're sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was, I was going to make a joke, but let's go. Okay. Uh, let's make a concussion going. joke. Like what is Cape Epic? But, uh, okay. <laughs> God. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But how uh, you guys vote. Do we want to go into the listener questions right now, or do we want to talk about the list, the host challenges? I vote listener questions. 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 Love it. David says, second time questioner, you previously gave me a brilliant answer on my question about HRV. Good to hear, David. Um, I'm glad that you, you like that one. I mentioned during that question that I've been away from cycling and racing for four years. The bike came out of hibernation around June, 2021. And for the remainder of the year, I just rode with no structured training as such and refound my love for the sport. Good on you, David, uh, for, for finding the passion with it around Christmas time. I stepped back into structured training and joined trainer road. And since then my FTP has jumped up 88 Watts and is back within 20 Watts of what I had when I was racing way to go. He says previously when 88 crit road Watts. racing, 88. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Back to the future level Watts. It's good stuff. Uh, it says <laughs> previously when crit and road racing, I would suffer with terrible pre-race anxiety to the point where I would quite often be ill and vomit in the hours before the race. And the feelings of disappointment if the race didn't go as planned would make, would keep me awake at night. Time away from the sport allowed me to contemplate these feelings. And I even spent time talking to professional counselors as it seemed this anxiety had seeped into other aspects of my life. Four years later, I'm in a much better place with work, family, and the expectations I put upon myself. When I began riding again, I told myself, this is just for fun. But as I've seen my FTP begin to rise again, caught up with old friends on the local group rides, I can feel the competitive bug coming back. So my question is, how have you dealt with pre-race nerves? And do you have any tips to deal with them and stay calm on race days? Finally, I love the podcast. He says, my apologies, but Spotify wouldn't let me give you a six-star review. So five stars left to do. Everyone go to Spotify right now, rate us five stars. And then you can also share the podcast directly from that to Instagram stories to your messages. It's super handy. It's the best way to share the podcast. So go check it out on Spotify. You can even see helpful chapters on there as well. Chapters are coming now to iTunes and other things as well. So good stuff. Nate, I want to lead with you on this one because we have a documentation of of Cat 5 to Cat (laughs) 2. And in uh, of you going from cat five to cat two, doing crits, road races, tons of different stuff. And you in openly, one year, in one year. Yeah, yeah, well done. And everybody, and you shared often how it was scary for you and that you were feeling this. So in fact, actually, while we, while you start talking about this, Maxine will bring up a video that we have. You can go to our YouTube channel, but Maxine, go ahead and bring up the video of, uh, of, of one of the races that Nate did where he was surrounded or really close to a crash. And it wasn't the only time, right, Nate? <laughs> this one upsets me because on this right here, this is the final lap, uh, as this is going. And I was, I had, I had actually, Oh my God. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. So what happened in there? I didn't actually crash. Uh, the people behind me crashed and I went, uh, straight forward and I had to stop pretty much. But uh, that, yeah. that's right. That's it, Maxine. We can um, exit from this. But he's like, please so, check that out on <laughs> YouTube, trainer road, or uh, youtube.com slash trainer road. On that race, that was San Rafael. Rafael? Yeah, San Rafael. Rafael. That is a great race to have a dropper post on because there's this really steep, fast, like, I don't know. Am I exaggerating to say 40 miles per hour turn? Uh, oh, no, not turn at all. The that's where the top pros go through there at that speed for sure. And Nate, uh, so <laughs> sorry, Nate. Um, you do, yeah. <laughs> this goes to the anxiety part of it, though, because I race my whole. If you watch the videos, my entire race strategy has to do with anxiety uh, to reduce <laughs> it and to for safety. And there are let me let me talk about anxiety for a second. Anxiety, according to my therapist, is there's two sides of it. There is uh, you don't have enough information, or you have too much information. 
So generally, uh, what I'm hearing here with uh, David's question is that he doesn't have enough information. He is wondering how he's going to perform and that like the end of the race. And I don't know if there's any um, injury, like, am I going to be hurt in this race? But that's my anxiety. If you listen to this podcast before, that's the one that I have for placement. It's not really a big anxiety thing, uh, but I'll, I'll go through both of them. So in races before I do a lot of, uh, um, I used to shoot rifles like 22s in high school. Uh, Amber in our high school, we had we had a gun range in our basement, which is <laughs> like crazy. And it's the only sport, like really, I did it for three years as a high school sport. Uh, it's the only sport where you don't move and you just have to relax. And so much of this sport was before uh, before we'd go in and shoot, um, the range was small, so we could only do it in groups. And you'd sit in a dark room and all you would do is visualize the bullseye over and over and over again. So what you do is you want to visualize what the proper outcome is because so much time when we get stuck in the anxiety, like ruminating thoughts, we think of the, the bad thing, the crash over and over and over again. And that's where our brain gets stuck on. And there's a whole bunch of science and, uh, around visualization, helping people in life, uh, and seeing what you can achieve. So what I would do is I would visualize the corner, the sprint, like what I'm going to do inside of the race. And, and that has really helped. Um, the other one is I know that I have mitigating factors for the, for the, uh, crash stuff and how I'm going to race. I know I'm, I'm, I check it out ahead of time. This is reduces, this increases information. This is a sketchy point. So at the beginning of the race, I'm going to sat, right? I'm going to be at the back of the race. I know I'm, I'm, I'm strong enough to be able to fight that I can bridge a, a small gap on a flat course on big descents, like San Rafael. I, uh, if you watch that race, I would like kind of do a small attack on the back side of the hill. So that could be the first one down the hill. And I have anyone in front of me most of the time, but also there were gaps. It was a smart way to race because other people hit their brakes. There'd be a bunch of gaps and people have to sprint back. So I, I would do these things to so that would, I know. So let me say it this way. I get anxiety on a really fast 40 mile per hour turn with lots of people around me. So I would either be the first person or I'd be far enough back where if there was something I could move out of the way that lowered my anxiety. I knew I could do it ahead of time. It was great. Um, for how you perform in a race, this is a whole nother issue of like your identity with how you perform, uh, like how you feel good about yourself, self-worth and things like that. Uh, the, this, this is, this is, a something you probably can't do here. This, this, you should talk to somebody about this, but the, uh, how I look at it, especially with video. So John and I, uh, we race, we got cameras on some, some of these views have, our videos have a hundred thousand views on it. Right. And people say mean things to me. So like every move we do it could be people saying <laughs> you're not X, Y, Z because of it. Um, which I'm okay with. I look at it as a learning opportunity. So like every race that I do, even if you did bad, especially with the cameras, you get to have, I'm really lucky. I get Amber and Pete and John to be able to critique my race but you get to learn and improve inside of that. And I get a lot of joy of improving. And even when I did something that is, did a silly mistake, you've seen the videos, I try to then prevent that mistake the next time. And that's then a goal for the next race. It's like, oh, I didn't, uh, I can think of one where uh, I followed a, someone's like, come with me, I'll take you to the front. And I, and I did that rather than just like do what I normally would do and, and read the race and actually make smart decisions in the middle. I did it wrong. Now I have a chance to do it right. And the, the chance to do it right is the exciting part that I can execute this other part of my race because I have no control over winning or not ever. Like mm -hmm. I do have no control over ex exactly. Uh, the more things though, that I can control that I do right. And I do the training, uh, that is the, that is more likely to win. And the other thing, when you start up, I was nervous every, every single time. Um, when I get nervous, I talk a lot, I'm mean, nervous on the podcast a lot. But I would just talk to everyone around me and then that helps. And so that would definitely lower my anxiety to be able to do that. Um, mm. That's probably the, uh, the experience I have to share on that. And everybody deals with this differently, right? Like um, in different ways. Ivy, how about you? You mentioned, I mean, you just raced uh, Land Park Criterium recently, which is cool yeah. to have you racing one of our crits. Uh, super Are you going to cool. help me right now? Yeah, I am. Because you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned that you were really nervous before that. I mean, you, it had been a long. When was the last time you had raced a crit? Before uh, that? like years. Um. Yeah. By the way, Nate, I totally won San Rafael 
in 2015. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> did, did you, were you the first down that descent? Uh, no, I was second wheel into the Second wheel. Yeah. Almost even better, right? Because you can then sit on them and then sprint around. Totally. It's too Good long. Especially when you're a bike them. handler like Ivy, right? Like <laughs> she's just, yeah. Totally yeah. barked before that race too, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I hadn't raced road in a long time when I decided to do land park uh, a couple weeks ago and was so nervous. And I won't tell <laughs> David to not be nervous um, because I tried that for years and years. And it's like, I'm, if, you're a competitor and it's okay to get nervous. And so instead of, for me, trying to just make myself not nervous, um, I mean, that nerve comes from wanting to perform and do well. And so instead I tried to recategorize it from fearful nerves of all of the unknowns in a race to excited nerves. It's okay to be excited and have nerves and like feel anxious before a race. If you're making it something that helps you perform, um, mm -hmm. Because for me, just trying to like shut down and not feel any of that yeah. hindered my performance. Um, so anyways, it comes for me from unknowns of not knowing the course, um, especially with off-road stuff like XC doing big marathon event where I haven't been able to preview the whole course. Um, not knowing what's out there just wrecks me. Um, not knowing what my competition is like, if I'm going to get ridden off the wheel or something. And so I tried to just, uh, kind of recategorize it into being excited and nervous by, um, I like have some affirmations, like I can perform well under pressure, I've done what I need to, to perform well in this event. And then if it gets really bad and I feel like I'm sick, I just do some sensory calming stuff. Um, like taking a break from getting ready from the race and folding some laundry, or I put an, I put an ice pack on my face and it, stuff like that really helps with the physical, like visceral reaction to being nervous, like vomiting and getting sick. Um, so I don't, I don't think it works to just tell yourself to not be nervous because if you're nervous and want to do well and putting pressure on yourself, it's almost impossible to just decide that that's not part of you anymore. I can't imagine be, how many, Oh, sorry, Nate, please. Wouldn't that be crazy? If we could just tell our emotions, don't do this, feel this, <laughs> feel like just be happy. Okay. Yeah. I'll be happy. Okay. <laughs> well, that's Amber. something that I totally experienced when people see me Cause I'm normally pretty jovial and like, like talk and I just, I get wrecked sometimes. And some people love them so much in my support circle are totally not helpful. They're just like, well, don't be nervous. You won like a hundred credits. Who cares? I'm like, thanks. That really helps me. Like, okay. I'm not nervous anymore. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I forgot all of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> thanks for reminding me. Amber, you have to have done, I don't know. I mean, if you combine swimming and cycling, thousands and thousands of races, uh, do you still get nervous and what's it like for you? Yeah, definitely. And I think it comes back to exactly what Nate and Ivy were describing. It's cause you care. I mean, it's kind of, it'd be kind of a bummer to line up at the start of a race and feel exactly the same about the race as you do for a training ride. I mean, that's not the point of racing, right? So I, I love that idea of flipping it from the negative nerves of fear to the positive nerves of excitement. Um, I, I love racing, so I get excited for it. And and over the years, I've figured out what works for me. And everybody is different in terms of what it is that um, that they need before a race. Like some people get super hyped up, and they really need to calm down. And some people have a really hard time getting hyped up. It just depends on what it is that you're struggling with. But I think um, to Nate's point about anxiety being around too much or too little information, that's like overthinking and uncertainty, right? So if you're somebody who struggles with uncertainty, take as much uncertainty out of it as you can. Like Ivy was mentioning, doing course recon can really help. Talking to other people who've done the race before, uh, making a plan, even if you know that you might have to throw it out the window, it's so calming sometimes to have a plan if you're somebody who struggles with uncertainty. And that can just look like get on Google Earth, check out the course, see if you can identify places that you think might be selection points in the race, decide ahead of time what you want to do that's within your control, right? Controlling the controllables, um, and then have that plan in mind. Having a pre-race routine can be really, really helpful because that takes a lot of the uncertainty out. You know exactly what you're going to do and in what order when you get to the race. And you can incorporate elements in a pre-race routine that help you either get more hyped up or calm down and that can look like music that can look like a stretching routine that could look like 
like Nate mentioned, walking around and talking to other people and just, you know, having a social aspect to of it could be really re reassuring and relaxing. Um, but figuring out, you know, what are the specific things that you can identify for yourself that are holding you back? And then how can you address those in a pre-race routine for yourself and experiment with it, you know, and, and it comes back to if, if your goal is to learn from the race, um, you really can't, you really can't lose out because you're going to learn something no matter what. And the key is to make sure that whatever it is that you learned, you apply in the future. Uh, Ivy mentioned affirmations. One of my favorite ones from when I first started racing, where I was, you know, getting into bigger and bigger races and feeling like there was a lot of expected, expected of me and not really ever feeling like I was sure that I could deliver on those expectations. The, what was really helpful for me was just to say, I'm going to get out and learn how to race my bike better today. And I would say that over and over to myself in my head because it was, it was true. I could believe in that. I could ground myself in that and I would, and it was a goal that I could set and, um, it was very grounding, but figuring out, you know, what are those key phrases or affirmations that might be helpful for you too. So, um, I, I would really recommend a pre-race routine and that can start, you know, two weeks out from the race in terms of the course recon and doing research. Two things that things to have two things to say was built on stuff you both said. Amber, that you talked about like Google Earth and re, re, recon. Course recon, yeah. Course recon. I am so much more neurotic than that. So what I would do <laughs> is I would go through, <laughs> I would go through um, YouTube, find every single recording of those races, and usually just full race videos. I would then watch those on the trainer for like weeks leading up. And let me tell you about visualization, being like just watching those YouTube videos one feeling like you're in the pack on the actual course makes me feel like so much better. And I could see, Hey, on this corner, they're on this side, they drop back on this corner on the outside and they move up and you get so much information. It's like you're riding it many times. And then I would look at the finishes and I would see where attacks were made that were winning finishes. And some races they are all kind of the same. Uh, and other ones I could see, Hey, everyone's, there's always a breakaway of this, but it always got brought back. Like it, I've, in the five races I've seen, and sometimes it's hard to get five, sometimes you only get two, uh, but you can learn stuff about how the race unfolds inside of that. And the next level, if there's a big descent or a turn that I'm scared, or scared of, I would stalk them on Strava, find that race and look at the max speed for that corner and be like, oh, that's only a 29 mile per hour corner rather than like a 45 mile per hour corner. And if it's 45, I know that I'm not gonna wanna be in that group. I wanna either be on the front or off the back because that's going to make, that's going to give me nerves inside of the group, and I'm not going to like it. Uh, and, and a little bit, I also have looked then at the top competitors and racing against what their VO2 max like. I'll look at like past workouts, look at the Genetic watts profile. <laughs> yeah, and try to figure out. Uh, uh, so on Strava, I could I can look at their watts if they're public, and then uh, I can see what they're good at, or or is this person someone I'm going to have to worry about inside of this kind of move. And normally it's always like, a, oh yeah, they're really, really strong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> darn it. And what you can't do anything about it besides train. Um, but you do want to watch them in the race uh, that, hey, this person is really strong. So if they go at this point that normally goes, I better go with them because they're going to, they're going to stay away. Mm -hmm. I love uh, this. I have this, I have this image of Nate prepping for a race as like a seventies detective show. And he's in his office, pulling out the files, <laughs> the filing drawers and pulling out all the folders on the competition. <laughs> this is more like the, oh, I imagine, um, I, Charlie I'm Day Tony from Stark. it's always sunny with the red strings. And... <laughs> <laughs> How you guys all think of me? Seventies detective, uh, crazy psychotic person and Tony Stark. Thank yeah. you, John. I, yeah. I picture like a uh, stock, stock market thing mail. person yes. with like six six monitors moving stuff around with lots yeah. of spreadsheets. You know, one point, I mean, one point. I, I, I should have I should have brought this Love up at it. the beginning because this doesn't just apply to racing, right? Um, mm -hmm. oh boy, like I've had sections of trail or even sections of road where I'm just like, I always have a headwind here, and and it, and I just really hate that, or or just something about it. Like the road surface just sucks, and. And it's funny, but, but those things do cause anxiety. So, and then there's big events that you have that are not like a race, but it's just like, you are going to go do a big route. Something. This is applies to all of us in different aspects. I'm sure I don't have anything to add. In fact, I, this has just been helpful for me to listen to and kind of reflect on what I do for, for nerves. I've spent my whole life racing. So I think I've done some unhealthy normalization of certain things. And then at the same mm -hmm. time, I think I've also, um, done a good job of seeing some things. I think egos involved a lot 
in a lot of it. And I, I don't want to <laughs> externalize that because I don't want to be perceived strangely. So, but I have one more thing to <laughs> everyone add. goes through it differently. Uh, what Amber and Ivy said, sorry, I've not been on the podcast for a while and I keep interrupting everyone. I'm sorry. Uh, I could get the timing, right. Okay. But what the, uh, okay. So you said about anxiety and turning it into excitement, there's actual research behind that about, so the feelings that you have in your anxiety for me usually is in my chest and it can feel sometimes I have like a low level in, in public, but inside of a race, it can be really tough. Right. And some people feel in their stomach and then they throw up, uh, you can truly make yourself feel better. You stand up, put your arms out and you say, I'm excited. I'm excited because the excitement feels the same way. If you're super excited, mm -hmm. you have that same feeling in your chest. And like, uh, so the, 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 but your head uh, processes it differently. It's not negative. It's a positive. Like I'm so excited for what I'm going to get Christmas morning. Oh my gosh. I don't know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get as a kid. Um, it, it could be worry or it could be a true excitement. So inside of these things, if you set, if you repurpose it and say, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. That's amazing. I don't only do that in racing, um, business deals, meeting new people, like anything where I become aware of my emotions. And I think, Ooh, I am, I have anxiety about this. I think maybe I'm just excited about this. This could mm -hmm. be really great. Um, and you start thinking that way. And then like your shoulders drop and they feel a little bit lighter and you stand up a little bit taller. And then that then makes you more confident too, at the same time. Just the, the body language, there's a whole, there's a whole TEDx about this or TED talk about this. Some people say it's not true. I don't care. I'll placebo myself all the, all the way. I think it's true. So <laughs> then therefore it is, uh, if just standing up straighter before a race and not being hunched over, having your shoulders back, having your chin up, like it just makes you feel better. I just did it right now. I just feel better in general. Then if you're like hunched over and you're small and you're looking around all the people that might beat you and you look at the legs, you're like, oh my goodness, they're so big. Um, the opposite happens too. They see you and they're like, the person's pretty confident. Why aren't they, uh, <laughs> oh my, should I be nervous? Do I, do I not know something that they know? Like, why are they so calm here? Um, even though inside of us, we're all little ducks, like with their legs flapping really hard, um, showing the confidence does make you actually feel more confident. Yeah, the sensations of fear and excitement are so similar. And there is one key difference though. When it's coming from fear, you tend not to breathe as much. So if you check in with your breath, that can be a really helpful thing to help you start flipping it around. Like you said, the the body posture is definitely important too, but the, the breath part, um, just make, you know, check in like, am I breathing? Okay, just breathe. And then those sensations, absolutely. There's so much overlap between fear and anxiety. It's It makes it really easy. It, it makes it easier to get your body to interpret it differently. I have a product recommendation that I just remembered this thing. I got to, John, I'm going to have to tell you what it is later or Maxine to do it, but this thing's, Can you I don't know if it, it? really, yeah, I'm going to say it. So this sounds like BS. I tried it and it, it was amazing. So when I was like depressed and break up stuff, I had a whole bunch of anxiety and I was trying meditation and breathing and that would help. Um, what, you have like a, the, what's it called? The Vega, Vega nerve, or is it Vegas nerve? Vegas nerve. Vegas, Vegas nerve, nerve yeah. inside your body. And you can get like excited and you feel not calm. And there are these headphones that you put on that do an electrical signal into your ear. You listen to music and it does that. Uh, and this could all be placebo. So I'm sorry if you buy it and it doesn't work for you, but literally within 15 seconds, I was like, like my shoulders dropped for the first time in like a month. And I felt relaxed. And I would use it all the time. I haven't used it for a race that I should, but the, it, it does something where it's supposed to stimulate your vagus nerve and kind of get you to relax. Um, if someone in chat uh, says what it is, I'll Google it to confirm. Camacore maybe? No, uh, I'll Google it when someone else is talking, but it's, it's, cool. it's pretty expensive. I think like around $150 or 200, but personally I had a, I had some great experience with it. Um, Nuvana perhaps. That's it. Nuvana. That is it. Yeah, N U N E U V A N A. Not sponsored. Just what Nate found no. helpful for him. And the app is horrible, and the you have to repair <laughs> it every time. And the music quality is not high. But I would listen to Maggie Rogers and do that thing, and just be like, "I'm happy. This is awesome." And then do deep breathing, like uh, Amber said, and it, it flipped my mood to relaxation really quickly. Uh, cool. Belly breathing can really help with stimulating the, the vagus nerve too. So mm -hmm. if you ch check in with your breath. Um, if you don't have some extra hardware to help you out, if, if you're just, and you just need a, something on the spot, you know, check in with your breath. And if you're breathing 
up high up in your rib cage see if you can drop that breath down into your belly and a lot of us carry a lot of tension in our bellies because well you know nobody we get a lot of uh i don't know social media input on how our waists <laughs> should appear and so there's yeah. a lot of sucking going on and i definitely sometimes i'll check and be like oh yeah whew, i just need to relax those belly muscles a little bit breathe into my belly and I, it's just, it can i just i started doing it while nate was talking and i was like oh yeah that feels good <laughs> <laughs> do y'all count when Dolls. you do it mm -hmm. yeah. when you run through the breathing yeah. in and out yeah yeah that yeah. helps too box breathing oh that so this is I should talk about box breathing box breathing <laughs> they teach these to navy seals that are uh, like they, or just in the military in general, if you get captured, you do box breathing to help relax you. Uh, and what it is, is you, you, there's different forms of it. I'm going to do the, you can look up and you can go on YouTube. There's guided ones for it, but you breathe in for four seconds. You hold for four seconds. You breathe out completely for four seconds and you hold for four seconds. So you kind of make this box and some people do longer on the exhale. Uh, there's different patterns of it. You do that mm, five, 10 times you do again it's vagus nerve uh it calms that and if they teach it to the military for being uh captured and stuff that sounds like a may work for a bike race too because it's a very hey. although same we might be fearing for our safety right and your body even though it is logically a less severe situation than being captured in a military context sometimes your body doesn't know the difference right you can even think of um, somebody does says something to you and you get that same reaction as if that were happen, especially depending on what has happened in your life before. Um, so don't, uh, how Ivy said too, don't be hard on yourself for having these emotions because they're there. Just don't ignore them, right? Feel them, breathe through them. Another way is when you have that anxiety and you breathe, you want to, so they call it feel your emotions, which is kind of confusing. But what you do is you say, okay, where is it feeling? Do I feel it? Now I'm going to do the breathing that Amber said and try to send like energy to it and then see if it moves. And you actually focus on it rather than trying to push it down. And that can also help relieve it inside of there. Uh, what Amber said, I'm like, you should buy this high tech thing. And Amber's like, or you could just breathe. That is like <laughs> the yin and yang of Amber and I, uh, uh, like over this whole podcast thing, uh, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> had great tips everything from visualization to going through and repurposing or reframing your perception of, of the situation and what you're feeling to actually the, you know, mechanical things are trying to calm the vagus nerve, lots of stuff. Great, great tips. Y'all appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, in this case, you can find yourself, David, still in that happy place with your bike and not finding mm -hmm. it being at odds with you know mental health. Uh, yeah. it's you definitely can be something... competitive. Mm -hmm. You can be competitive and happy. It, yes. It, they're not mutually exclusive. Just win all the time. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> There's the chest again, right there. Um, okay. Trevor says, uh, Hey, trainer road crew. I've been listening and watching your podcast since 2020 and finally decided it was time to try plan builder this year. I'm training for the Transylvania mountain bike, epic stage race in Pennsylvania this May. And I'm using Moab rocks as a tune-up race next weekend. So this that's this weekend. You're probably in Moab, Utah, Trevor. Good luck. Uh, good luck wow. with that one. That's going to be awesome. And you're taking on a monster of a race I've heard in Transylvania Epic. So uh, pretty sweet. He says, the goal is to learn as much as I can about multi-day stage race nutrition, recovery, and how my body will react, but also go hard and just see how I've how fit I've gotten the past four months. I'm excited to hear, Trevor. You Please check in and let us know too how it goes after using Trainer Road and all that stuff. We've had plenty of athletes use, use Trainer Road for Transylvania and had great results. Check out our successful athletes podcast for a couple examples. Actually it says, my question is about pacing stage one in Moab. It starts with a 13.5 mile, 3,200 foot climb, then descends a tech technical terrain for nine miles. I plan on riding the climb by RPE, but do have a power meter to glance at being that it's a long climb with a technical descent. Should I ride this in an endurance zone or more tempo or threshold? I'm guessing it will take about an hour and a half to get to the top and 40 minutes to descend. If it helps, I'd rather go too hard and suffer than leave too much in the tank. I've heard you talk about pacing strategies based on percentage of effort, but that seems low for a two to two hour and 30 minute stage. So any help specifically for mountain bike stage races in general would be much appreciated. And goes on to share that he is 190 pounds, 300 watt FTP, intermediate mountain biker, but experienced endurance athlete. Uh, and he's following the mid volume MTB marathon plan. He's in the build phase right now. So 
Um, thanks for the entertaining or thanks for entertaining me every week during my rides. Love the content and all of your guests from Trevor. Uh, so first of all, um, Ivy, you've done tons of stage races <clears throat> and I want to talk to you about pacing stage races because in this case, Trevor's saying he'd rather go too hard than too easy, uh, on the first stage, but that kind of makes me nervous. Does that make, does that and like ring any alarm bells for you, uh, having gone through a lot of stage races? <laughs> Yeah. And I'm thinking specifically of some of the North American road stage races, um, like UCI, Joe Martin, um, North star. I don't know if that one's still around. Um, but they mm-hmm. often put, uh, some of the most messed up stages at the end <laughs> of the race. And those opening ones are maybe long, but super chill. And if you're looking at the people that you're racing with, they're riding it kind of conservatively knowing what's coming. Um, so Trevor also wonders if they should ride it at threshold for an hour and a half. If I tried to ride threshold for 90 minutes and then do a nine mile descent, I'd wreck myself. Like <laughs> specifically for that question. Um, I know they, w- I know Trevor wants to go hard and, you know, maybe try to see how that first stage shakes out, but Holy cow, I would not try to go into that descent super tired. Um, and mm. looking at the whole scope of the stage race and trying to get as much information, Nate, Charlie Day, red strings about the whole entire <laughs> stage, stage race and what those following stages will look like will help you feel more prepared and know how to pace it and know how much you should be saving or, um, you know, and thinking about your own abilities and knowing where you can do the best maybe those later stages are going to be really, really bad for you. And maybe that first stage is your chance to get a result and you should put all your eggs in that basket. But really that comes down to knowing yourself really well. Um, trying to pre-ride that course if you can, sorry, Trevor, you're already there. It's probably too late. I hope you got to pre-ride all of it. Uh, (laughs) and, um, yeah, really knowing where your chance will be based upon, uh, what that course looks like. It just takes some, some Nate math before the race. That's some hate math. <laughs> Amber, how about you? Stage racing, it was literally your job. What would you mm-hmm. say in this case? Because even though it's mountain biking to road racing, there's the like pacing is pacing to a certain degree when you're talking about day after day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I want to just emphasize what Ivy said real quick because I think that that's really the key here is identifying what your goals are. So over a stage race, you could be going for a single stage win. You could just be opportunistic and going for any stage win where there's an opportunity for one. You might be going for the overall general classification. And depending on what your goal is, it's going to change your strategy. So like Ivy said, if you're somebody who's going for the overall GC, you're going to look at the stages and decide, you know, what are the days that are going to give you the most opportunity to gain the most time? on your competitors and you're probably going to be conservative on the other days so that you can really hit those days with focus and as much energy as possible on the other hand uh, if you're somebody like me i was racing in support of somebody on the road which i know doesn't apply in mountain bike but i was also somebody who was opportunistic and looking for a stage win so toward the ends of stage races what was kind of nice is if the gc gets pretty solidified and it doesn't look like there's going to be much change um, i would often get free reign to go for a stage win and by that point All the GC leaders, who are usually the strongest people in the race, are mostly concerned with GC, less concerned about stage wins. And so as somebody who was lower on the GC, I had a nice long leash to go for a stage win. Um, So there's just different tactical considerations here, too, beyond looking at what percentage of FTP should I be doing my climbs. Mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind is this is a race. So it isn't just about going by your power numbers. It's also about going by your competitors. What are your competitors doing? And then taking that into consideration in context of what your particular goals are. Um, So race the race, you know, and take it one day at a time. Um, I think it's important to remember that on day one, everything you do is going to affect day two, day three, day four. So eat really, 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 really well. You're eating not just for that day, but you're eating for the next day and for the last day. You want to hydrate really, really, really well. Um, do not want to get behind on that stuff. So just stay on top of it and keep that, you know, top of mind at all times, especially early in the race when it's easy to get complacent because you're not feeling it yet. Um, 
and kind of, I don't know, one of the things I used to do was just, I'd pretend that that, that day was the only day, you know, keeping in mind that I need to eat really well to prepare for the, the upcoming stages and also keeping in mind what the tactical implications were for, uh, stages down the road. But it was just sort of like today, my focus is on what I need to do for this stage. And then once that stage was over, the second you cross the finish line, you're prepping for the next one, but you don't need to do that until the race is over. So just focus one day at a time. Um, and, and easier said than done, but as much as you can, I think it really helps. I, uh, Nate, get ready to box breathe a bit on this because the stage that he's doing is porcupine rim, uh, where you have had, God. Some... <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> box breathing, Nate, <laughs> box breathing. Um, yeah. we're, Nate. we're just dragging it. Uh, Nate, we love you so much. It's all out of love. We're not, we're not attacking you today. <laughs> um, we're just throwing up all these memories of crashes for Nate. Oh, it's just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Join us for YouTube kind to just see the face Nate made. Um, uh, so. Uh, what, here's what I want to bring in though. So, because the advice from Ivy and Amber, fantastic. And, and we have a temptation when we're riding mountain bikes to think it's totally different than other forms of racing. And it's really not, um, in that regard, when you're talking about pacing time after time, uh, you'll be able to recover better than you think, particularly if you've been following, uh, a training plan with consistency, that's really going to help you when you show up at a stage race, because you're like, Hey, I train Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, or I train Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or I've stacked days. It's one thing I would recommend if you're leading into a stage race. Uh, and if you typically train every other day on weeks where you're not at the end of a loading cycle. So like maybe the first week after a rest week or the second week after a rest week, instead of doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example, try Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, try to like stack them together just to see how you feel when you do three days in a row, because a lot of it is just familiarizing yourself. You're going to wake up on day two, day three, and you're going to be like, Oh, I am so tired, but you'll get on the bike and you'll be able to do more than you think you could if you just laid in bed. Right. Because judging by that, our legs always feel really tired and we aren't ready to go. So do that. Uh, can I talk about this course in particular? And I know that this is kind of just really specific advice for this athlete and not for everybody else, but I will try to bring out some specific takeaways. I had to do this I know, course. I know part of this course. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Forgot bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, so this course I have actually had to ride like a race because so this course you climb from the town of Moab and you climb part way up porcupine rim, but you go like on a fire road to get there. And then what you do is you ride down. And then once it gets really scary, Nate, the trail gets really bad. Um, that's when they stop. And I think it's because of some sort of like forest service regulation or something where they can't have a race because of they the do that terrain it goes in really, really steep part on like lower porcupine. Like you go down this flat rock and it is steep. Do you remember I that? I think they do. Yeah. I think they do that. They don't do the part where it gets really narrow single track and it's like goat trailing along the edge of a huge cliff into the river. I don't think they race at that point. They stop there. So that, like, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, Nate, bringing back memories. But the thing is this race, you climb up and it's either paved or a very broad fire road and you climb quite a lot. However, that climb is gained in rollers. It rolls quite a lot. This is a huge opportunity for you. If you're looking at around an hour and a half climb time on this, I don't know if that would be accurate for you or not. I'm just going off what you said in this case, Trevor, but if you're going for an hour and a half, if you could hold 0.9 for that, holy cow, you will have done a fantastic job. I don't know if you'd be able to hold 0.9 because you referenced the blog post or our discussion last time. We have a fantastic blog post called how to build a pacing plan for long events on the train road blog, where we break down for different durations, what a rough IF target should be or intensity factor target. And I don't think you'd be able to hold 0.9 for that hour and a half climb. That would be really hard. And then the other thing that makes it even harder is the rollers. So if you can keep power over the top and down on a roller, you will gain so much time on everybody because they will push hard and too hard on the climb. They'll feel exhausted and they'll ease up on the descent and you'll be able to just gain bike length after bike length. If you can rest a little bit lower on that climb, don't, you know, don't go whole hog on the climb, but then keep that gas on over the top and over the, over, and down the backside of it. It'll be amazing. And that's how you pacing at like a 0.8 to 0.85 will actually be way faster if you can hold that power consistently over the course. So that's just a big tip for this course, but also for everybody in general, like ride with really good triathletes 
when they're doing a, a workout and they're going to hold some power. And especially cause they're on a TT bike, but they will blow your doors off when it comes to downhills and, and rolling over the top of climbs because they are so disciplined in keeping that power consistent. It really is a fast way to ride. Yeah. So agree with John, the even more so is on the mountain bike. You're not going to be the aerodynamics are not going to be an issue unless there's like a headwind and that's going to affect the climb or the descent. So triathletes, they will, they'll put up a little bit, teeny bit more power on the climb, but then they'll really have, um, more power on the descent than road racers, like all the time, because they're, they're not in a group and they're just solo, but mountain biking, if you can get that pretty even split, that would be amazing. There's going to be a lot of shifting involved. So be careful or be ready to shift. And then shifting, we've talked about so many times as you get to the top, uh, it's so easy. It's a good time to look at your power meter to go off on the power. You don't even realize it, right? You like, you look down, you're like, Oh, I'm 30 Watts less right now, but you do that over and over again. You're going to gain seconds. And I was going to say, Trevor, um, 0.82 IF. So close to you, John. And then, but what you also have to do is I don't know where you're coming from. Moab's what's the elevation of Moab. It's About pretty 4, high thousand feet. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are coming from sea level, you're going to have to Google that conversion chart and do the math and have a lower power target. And you might want to have your normalized power be this, cause it's going to be really hard to get your average power there. And if you're trying to chase average power, because you're going to have some zero watt things and that really low, lowers it down out of NP there, go for that 0.82. It's a stage race. And, uh, what you are going to experience is stage one, the very beginning. Uh, I disagree with Amber. Well, it's different points of view myself being 190, 300 many times. I don't race the race. It's my own race by myself. It's like a TT, right? Because there'll be people around me who are way stronger. And if I try to go with them, I will not make it. But to Amber's point, day three, four, five, there are people who are like, these people are really close to me. Then you have a race on, but that very first starting stage, I'm, I think we all know this, but people will go ham, you know, they go, I don't know what the word is ham out. <laughs> too I, hard. I'll, New word of ham out. So one person on this podcast <laughs> loves to do it. So it's really bad. <laughs> uh, uh, with the things. I'm gonna have Ivy. I'm gonna have in my background that red like string thing all around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, they will go so hard, and especially to Amber's point, one an hour thirty. This first time, you're not gonna be hungry. You're not gonna be thirsty. There are rollers. People are gonna be blowing by you you this is what you're going for is you're going to have that kind of tempo. You're going to be in that V2 area, not, no V3 at all. So ventilatory threshold three, I said it right. Not at all. Ah. It's not going to happen. You're going to be in the two where you can, you know, it's, but not the, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's going gotta, from bad to worse. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is y'all missed me on the podcast. I know. Um, so anyways, you want to be there. That's like the RPE part of it. And you can catch yourself, especially at elevation. Uh, if you're not used to it mm -hmm. and you're going up, if you start at four, you might be up to 7,000 feet. That is crazy. Uh, that will be a huge difference. And as you're climbing up, be okay with your power dropping. Like mm -hmm. this is just going to happen. And it doesn't mean poor pacing. There's just less oxygen. And you're trying mm -hmm. to maintain that RPE because you have, how many days is this, by the way? Four, um, I think it's four days. I could be wrong. Four days. I think it's four. Four days. Definitely the pacing on the first day will impact days two, three, four, for sure. Uh, but I like the... Uh, to combine with Amber's, I, so eating and drinking for that first 90 minutes is going to have huge dividends later on your race. Everyone else is going to be stressed out. They're going to be, you know, hands on the bars. If, if it's going to be packed, having a, um, a, like a light, uh, hydration pack is amazing in order to drink and then keep up on your nutrition. And what, when I, I think it's the use way one, I think it adds a pound the over, Outlander uh, Pro. Yep. Yeah. So it's very light. And what I did is I took two bottles that I would normally carry, weighed those with liquid and the, uh, and the actual bottle. And then I took the same amount of liquid, put it in my pack and it was one pound difference. And the benefit that though you get of not having to reach down there and always being able to drink, especially if it's packed is huge. And that one pound, you're going to make up so much time. Cause the, the eating and drinking when Amber said is amazing. And those other especially days on porcupine rim, like you're not going to get time to drink going down. Yeah. Right. And it darn right dangerous. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Those who don't know, uh, I have 27 stitches in my face from a rock on that, uh, course. And that was too, the, the course isn't actually that technical. 
it was, I was following someone in, on a descent. We were, he went the wrong way and then he just stopped in the middle. Uh, and that's, then I, yeah. whoosh, and I went and I hit a, a rogue rock that's been there for a million years and hit me right in the face. It's been waiting for yeah. me. But in general, what I would say too on that is give people a little bit of space because tricky things can come up on that. And yeah. so don't be, especially if you're, you're intermediate biking, 190, 300 pounds, like give some people some space and, but look ahead too and see what lines they take. And if you like it, uh, cause it, what will happen is you go over these, there are these big rock slab sections and you it's, I don't know where the line is. There's no, like, uh, there's no tire marks for the line. It's really Maybe wide real... trail, right? It's yeah. like you could fit multiple Jeeps side by side in some cases going down this trail. So it's kind of like choose your own adventure. Uh, it's, uh, this is the downhill part. So it's, a, it, you know, recon, yeah. if you're able to, is very important in my opinion on that trail. I, it, it, that trail is so long too, that even with recon, I don't It'd know if I would be able to remember it. Like Keegan might be able to, but this is where if you yeah. give people room and you see somebody and they, and they have their, let me say this, these sections, there's probably 10 different lines that you could take, right? There's multiple ones. Someone has a good one, or you're good at picking the lines, do that. I would, if John was ahead of me, that'd be great to follow him. I'm not fast enough, but if someone gets in trouble, don't be really close. Cause they could do a line with a big drop and they could stop it or something like that. Uh, yeah. So 0.82, that's what I do. Then look at the elevation side yeah. note. I thought of a cool marketing thing. Okay. Okay. You ready? Let's do it. Two. Yeah. Amber, it's for you. Well, first, oh. um, <laughs> I'm glad I said, like, oh, never, never uh, <laughs> sorry, Amber, <laughs> going back to the, um, to the Nuvana thing. There's another product called Apollo that I got that like taps your leg. It's like taps your oh. leg, your wrist. I, I got no benefit from it. Um, but I just know somebody, I think mentioned it, or I, I remembered it. Um, so that's okay. another one. This that's is what I have. Idea? I, this, <laughs> the, no, this is the idea. Yes. Okay. So what if, so we all have race anxiety, right? Uh, before a race. And we know that calming and like box breathing could help and having somebody guide you through it would be awesome. Who here has the most calming voice that is like soothing. And we all have confidence in her is that we have Amber walk us through like a 10 <laughs> box breathing. I'm serious. A YouTube video before your race. I, I would. I was a hundred. You're like, who has the calming voice? I was like, oh yeah, Chad would be amazing at this. I, like, <laughs> no. I, just, I think it would be Amber. I, I totally Honey thought of this. I was, I was like, we gotta have Amber or Chad or Nate or someone do like a med guided breathing meditation video. And then I was like, nah, that's that would be embarrassing. So I'm glad. No, we we should do both Chad <laughs> and Amber. And yeah. just like, it would be, it takes like a two minute video. And I'd like to put on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. We just bring it up straight to the point. We rock you through it. You do it 15 minutes before your race really helps calm you. Uh, I can see Amber with some affirmations. With you. You've done yeah. what yeah. you need to, to perform well. Exactly. Okay. Like your trust do your it. body. Love it's this. all in there. I would love Bodies to, are I would amazing. watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ham, I would go ham out. <laughs> <laughs> My video, you should do my video. It'll be completely, when's April 1st? Tomorrow. I'll have to do my, uh, my affirmations. We uh, should have an alternative Nate version for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with the things, just like math, like you're going to be able to do it with all this stuff. But I, I mean, the seriously, spreadsheets. even before bed and stuff like that. What's your that? power at elevation? <laughs> 100 grams Nate, an hour. Nate's reading the conversion charts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i kind of want to make that happen too but <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know put it in the chat would you actually listen to this i think it would be amazing for all races even workouts somebody mm. mentioned here having workout anxiety mm. that's totally a real thing we have workout anxiety so it's not just in races and this is the no one's going to see it but can i perform to this am i good enough for this adaptive training uh helps with that uh, a lot but it would just be great to do that i mean Darn it. Here's, mean, here's your pre ram putting, test one. Ready? I just put a Ready? poll into the live chat for this very thing. Yeah, do so it, if you're do in it, the Amber. live chat, I, you, can, you can go. I know what Amber's going right. to say. Do it. Here's, here's your pre ram test one. Push the use FTP detection button. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. I like it. Anxiety, gone. <laughs> can, I, can I talk about some product stuff that she brought it up? Because product. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, because we can. Uh, can I just say one more thing on, the, on this, this course? Um, so first of all, it's a three-day race, not a four-day race. I apologize. Um, also, uh, really good folks that run that race, uh, the same ones that do single track six, which is pretty cool. Um, 
But uh, the last thing I want to say is that this day that you have on this course, so so there's a lot of technical trail where it's you'll be stuck behind people and it's kind of single tracky throughout this race, but they always endeavor to give you like fire roads and different spots to be able to pass and everything else. So just don't, don't stress too much about like, I really need to get in a really strong first day and I need to, don't worry about that. Like Nate said, people are going to go out way too hard on day one stay within yourself and ride stage one as if you're going to have a strong stage three. Trevor, you're still going to go really hard. I know that you're going to do that. I know that you're not going to go easy because of stage three. So just keep this in mind. Be like, I want to have a strong stage three when you're riding stage one. Um, mm -hmm. Keep your power on, pedal as much as you can on that climb. On the downhill, do not worry about pedaling. Just find those safe and smooth lines and then it'll work out. Uh, good luck. It's exciting stuff. This yeah, goes, I have, wait, wait, I'm, I'm more just, I, I okay. can't stop. <laughs> Go this goes to what Amber said too, again, <laughs> is that, uh, th there's two different ways, especially when you're <clears throat> mid pack. Cause I'm, I am mid pack, especially on these types of races and sometimes back quarter. Uh, if you, it, so Amber said, I go a little bit easier so I could do stage wins later. Right. Where I would not have that happen, but mm. you go a little bit easier. You get your competition you get to smoke them later, right? The whole rest of the race, you get to pass yeah. these people. You mm -hmm. get you get put in a corral that is that is better and not like smoke them, smoke them. Like you're not really going slow. Um, but the ability to not drop in fitness makes your confidence for that race, like the, the other days. I mean, I'm a, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm pretty competitive. And on <laughs> like those other days, just not being the person who gets dropped in all the climbs because you fueled improperly, you went too hard, having the opposite. It, it's pretty fun, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to do that. So, and then you get a air quote stage winning against the people that you raced against. Noah Sears did this to me in opposite. Uh, I beat him on the first day. <laughs> the other days he beat me from, um, MSRP. No, not MSRP. MRP. MRP. Yeah. MRP. Um, <laughs> yeah. MSRP. Uh, Shout out to this... Noah and Sparky. I'm sure they're listening. <laughs> yeah. And I bet they're racing Moab rocks and they could win their divisions. Uh, they're trainer road users and just awesome people. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I did not know we could do polls and chat. I know. I could do a poll at any time. Power oh, unleashed, no. Nate. You're an admin. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. So right now it is 81% of the people said they would use a pre-race calming video or audio file. So that's that's 32 votes only. Uh, but still, that is. If you're watching, there's many more of you watching. Vote. <clears throat> so I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then again, maybe they're watching. Maybe they're just listening and they're doing like emails or spreadsheets at their desk or something. So. Um, or a understand. super hard workout right now. You never yeah, know. Yeah, true story. Nate, you said you wanted to, let, let's, let's do, I'm going to call this uh, Nate's intermission because I have a number of things that I want to ask you, but you said that you also want to talk on some product stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my, my thought right now is to be way more open on product roadmap and then just trust people that it's the things, these things take time and we'll get feedback from you. And, and uh, these aren't things okay. years down the line. They're like months. Things yeah. change too. Things change mm -hmm. too. Yep. So this is the stuff we're actually working on. So running the, the, we're going to have the workouts come in, be synced to, uh, workouts or to the, the plan workout, have like the, the ride details page that we have, we have it for running and then have PRs that is, we've done probably like 70% of that. And the team of it's a big team working on it of 10 engineers still going forward on that. No resources have changed from that. They're still going forward. Amber's team is doing the AI FTP detection which is dope. Um, we have just a little bit more visioning to get that to the, the production, but that's really close. And that is where instead of taking a ramp test, you push a button and it tells your FTP and we've had so many <laughs> amazing. I know, uh, we we've actually had the ML team has done other releases to get that even more like precise inside of it. But look at the forum. We've had a lot of people, uh, a great success for it so much so that in the future it's going to be the default option that's how confident we are in it that it is better than taking the ramp test and especially if you under test or over test because this is like uh, built, uh training on, on everybody it'll get you to the like an actual better result than if you took it yourself uh yeah john yeah i want to clarify one thing nate and i'm sorry track hack from short track last night i, I know people <laughs> don't like all the throat clearing Thanks, Amber, for making me feel like not the only one. We got this. Got it. <laughs> um, got your back. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. Um, if you're listening to this, you probably cough too. So don't hate us. Um, okay. Uh, but Nate, you said it's the default option. I want to just be clear that Nate's a default option. Or yeah, it okay. will be. 
but it is not the only option. You'll still have the option to take the test. This is just going to be the default option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this part on that is a little bit farther out, but the idea is that for plan builder, uh, basically the ramp test will no longer be in the plans by default. You can have an option to put them on there, but what we'll do is you'll just work through your progressions and then we'll tell you when your FTP should be higher. This mm -hmm. is just like a coach would do. Uh, so it doesn't have to be at a set interval and some people, so what in the background will constantly be checking. And when we think that you should have a higher FTP, we'll tell you, uh, this is what I want, right? That you don't have test anxiety. You don't, you're not looking forward to it. There's no judgment day. All you got to do is focus on that next workout to, uh, can I, you know, am I, am I getting better on that? The second thing is the, uh, we call it workout levels V2, but basically it is the scoring outside rides. And what are those points? Like how much threshold, how much aerobic, uh, and to be able to those outside rides, you do an hour climb and then a four hour endurance ride. You should get points for both. The state it's of that cool. is it's so cool, yeah. like totally unprecedented and super neat. We are tuning it and validating it. So there is, uh, it's, it's all built on the, the, the scoring of it, but what we have to do now is go back to our history and say, if you scored this, can you then do the workouts afterwards and make sure that we like, uh, we think it's good, but we have to validate it, right? There's two different sections to that. And we want to validate over a lot of data. The other part that we need to do with this is the red light, green light project, which is like have with we these three things together. I'm not sure if we, we talked about this, but we have on the totally podcast. Have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, these three things together, the detection, the, the outside scoring and red light, green light, red light, green light is intro week changing. Like if you had a, uh, based on your recent history, let's say you did a hard ride on Monday. Well, Tuesday's VO two max, it might not supposed to be VO two max right now. We kind of tell the athlete, uh, to, if they, they could do an achievable workout, they could take a rest day and skip it. And we kind of put the, um, that decision point on the athlete through guidance. We're going to then make that decision for you. And adaptive training could tell you, this is a rest day. This is the day to watch Amber's box breathing video, just hang out <laughs> or, um, this is maybe a little bit easier day. And we do that with workout levels V2, the outside ones, because you will actually progress a little bit faster inside of those levels. And we don't want to release that without this other part, because we don't want to, uh, we don't want you to score at a quicker rate than, than you should. So we're going to make sure that we mm, don't give you too much extra work, which could happen in this case, if depending on the amount of outside rides you're doing. So these things together, uh, Amber stuff is pretty close for the first one and then workout levels, uh, in workout levels V2, like I said, has to be validated, but basically that's what we're working on. Uh, and then the really auto detection exciting. is pushed out a little bit farther after those two things, because we want the outs, the workout levels V2, the outscoring outside rides and the, uh, red light, green light, which is the intra, uh, week programming out before the auto detect until we get the auto detect out, you can just push the button. Like Amber said. That's going to be in the product, hopefully, uh, relatively soon. It's an early access now. So if you go on the website and click on what is it, account information or your profile, mm -hmm. there's a little section yeah. on the left that says early access. You can turn it on. And to do that, then if you have a ramp test scheduled in the app, there'll be a button there in your career uh, for that day to detect your FTP. We also have a 14 day uh, window on this where we want you to. Uh, what was happening is people were looking at it every single day and the way the machine learning works is like, it's got a little bit of like a uh, wiggle in it as it goes up. And it might say you might do a workout. And then the next day it, it does like one watt lower and the next day it's one lot higher. And what people were doing is they were trying to reverse engineer it saying like, Oh, I did this workout. This then made me less fit, which is not true because one, your FTP doesn't change that fast. And the, the way that the ML works, uh, is it has to, you know, it looks over time and stuff. So by having 14 days as a gate, we can truly see if there was enough change in there that you should actually could change your FTP. But it, honestly, people don't change your FTP every 14 days, like work through the progressions. Uh, yes. that's not recommended. Uh, it might feel good to do it, but you don't need to do it. Yeah, not at all. Uh, cool. Nate, I have some questions for you, uh, topics that we've recently covered. And I want to hear your thoughts on, first of all, Cape Epic just happened. What's oh that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. What's that? He says, Sophia <laughs> won. She did so good. I know. 
and she raced it like a pro like and i know she's a pro but what i mean by that is that she raced it like a veteran cape epic racer that has like done it many times like they picked their stages they didn't have the strongest prologue but they picked their stages and they like placed their efforts so strategically then they defended really well like it was um after watching like cape epic in the past and everything else like this this looked more in control and well managed like that that lead than i can think of another win that i've seen like it was really just so impressive Com- super cool commanding yeah 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 it was uh told y'all told you so she's super <laughs> fast right she's super f- yeah. i mean if uh sometimes on the podcast we say that people are super fast and you don't know she won cape epic okay like yeah, yeah. that is super fast and uh mm-hmm. yeah total confidence in her she's so gritty too like yeah to see her do cape epic last year and for those who don't know she pushed me through the prologue and then i crashed halfway through stage one she was my partner last year and then she wrote solo uh but like it is she went so deep and like her what she's really good at is it seemed like her spirits never went down it could be rainy cold like you know she lost me as a partner but she was always a positive mindset and that combined with the tech and the the skill like positive mindset like that that is gritty right Mm -hmm. uh yeah some people grit through and they're like angry the whole time but next level is to have that like i don't i'm not shooting cortisol through my body the whole time i'm relaxed and trying hard which is i know you john you saw the rest of the race uh what was her spirits like last year just you know uh yeah she's she's even keeled she never gets too high never gets too low you know what I mean? Like she just, she's, she's well managed. It's, uh, yeah. she's, she's just super impressive. I wonder what I'm... that's like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I feel the same way, Ivy. <laughs> I feel the same way. Highs are um, highs, lows are low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she did a great job. Uh, Keegan and Maxime were another team. Um, Keegan had like, uh, I think they both were like really gun ho going into it. And then I think I know. Keegan basically had heat stroke. Like after the prologue, he was laying down in bed that night with like, just after the race, like pure goosebumps, freezing cold, mm-hmm. shivering. And it was like over a hundred degrees, like really hot. Uh, of course he wouldn't mention that. So that's me mentioning this. Um, and then, but he just like carried on. And then I think Maxime training for XCO, he like, once they got to like day two beyond that it really started to break him down but they had an absolute blast they got a podium on the last stage too uh kudos to them uh it'd be awesome to see like if maxime focused on marathon which i don't know maxime's goals you know if he's still going to do xco xcm whatever but i bet if he focused on marathon they could be toward the front um because they were around top 10 Uh, they were top five overall for a while and then top 10 so but congrats to everybody that did it uh anybody listen to this that did it anybody that finishes Cape Epic is incredible like that. That yes. is, and that's coming even from, from Keegan's mouth as well. A guy that typically nothing is hard for, right? Like nothing's hard for him. Yeah. He was like, I don't know how people do this. He's like, they were out there for eight hours today. Like, I don't know how they do it. Like the people that it's just, it's such a cool race and kudos to that event. Such good coverage. Super cool. I have a couple more things to say about AFTP based on the chat. Please. Uh, one, Someone said, are you all interested in feedback on how AFTP compared to an FTP test later that day? I, how close was it? Should we submit that info? So one, yes, we do know that info, but we actually look at is what you do in training afterwards. Cause that is the most important part is what you do in training afterwards. Um, uh, and again, AIFTP detection is amazing when it's paired with adaptive training. So what we set you at and the next workout you do is very specific to the workout level we put you at. And you might say, oh, but at, I did this FTP, so I should be able to do this like level eight, nine, 10 threshold workout. We're not trying to start you in there at your new FTP. So I've seen some people say that is, oh, I can't do a level nine workout of this FTP. Like, yeah, we're not prescribing a level nine at this FTP. We could downgrade your FTP uh, and tell you what you would do at a level nine or 10, because that's like math that we have on the back end but we don't specifically tell you to do that. So if you hear people say that, um, don't worry about it. It's the combination of the two. The other one that I love hearing, and we've seen this inside is when someone goes, it's absolutely wrong. It's not that high. You're no way possible. Ivy's like, yes, he's seen this. 
then like a few days later, they're like, okay, so it was right. Like, I didn't know I could go this hard and it really wasn't that hard. It felt just right. And their RPE was, was right. So again, we look at what you can do afterwards, but also your RPE response. So there is a, a, a level of RPE that we want you at. We don't want the threshold to be at easy. Uh, that's like a one out of five. We don't want the sweet spot to be like an all out effort either. So that's also helped us give data to tune the information. So the best thing that you can do is train afterwards and answer the RPE questions. And uh, that then in mass gives us all the data that we need. Um, Cause there's sometimes one offs too, where you could be sick, right? And you, you do a array, you, you, <clears throat> it tells you something, you can't do the next workout. You're like, this is not working. But if we look at a mass, there are some outliers, which we don't know. It could be anxiety, you know, so many things could be an issue. <clears throat> But looking at the data in math, that puts, that's what helps us tune it up and, and do it. So, yeah. yes. AI FTP detection levels, the progression levels work hand in hand to give you the best training. It's good yeah. stuff. Nate, uh, warm ups. We talked about warm ups quite a lot. And this is something that we have known for quite some time. However, we haven't shared it, but we figured we might as well spill the beans. Uh, oh. I don't think that it would make people <laughs> too upset. Uh, Maxine, I think that you, so you have, uh, Maxine's just going to run through a handful of the photos while we talk about this. Bro, we talked about warmups and we talked about all the different ways you can warm up. And we talked about the fact that trainer road has different warmups that you can use, how you can use a workout for that. You could even create a custom workout to do it. And the cool part is that trainer road can be like a measured thing, but we have some pictures that we wanted to share with everybody. And you can see different athletes, uh, notable ones, right? Nate that have used it. <laughs> yeah. And uh... we have images of it. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what happens here? So we don't sponsor any pro athletes, right? Uh, yep. well, we actually did Keegan for a while and Sony Looney for a while, but none of this top level, but what you can see, what we get is, um, world, some world champs, people at before world champs at the highest level of the sport using trainer road, uh, in their, like around their tent and stuff. And people like take pictures of them using it. And then they all send it to us on Instagram. And some of these people are sponsored by competitors, which <laughs> just for us feels, uh, that's the, that's the best, right? When you're sponsored by one wheel sponsor, but your world championships, DTT, they like, they put the black tape over the logos and they're like, Nope, we're yeah. using another brand. Uh, yeah. so John, you want to say the, the people yeah. like, this is just some of them, the ones we can remember to find pictures, uh, yeah. but who, we who, know there who, are who more out this? there. Um, but Matthew Vanderpool, he's warming up at multiple different world championship races that you who, can see Who's here. that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder, <laughs> right. Um, uh, I think this might be a bold claim, but in 10 years, we'll call him the best cyclist ever. Uh, that's my, that's my anticipation there. So Matthew Vanderpool, Sam Gaze also using it, uh, Sonic Hans using it before, uh, world champs as well. And Ron Heibel, I have ruined your name. I apologize so much because <laughs> oh, no, when I hear job. German say it, it's like, Vonka? I don't, I don't know. So anyways, uh, but uh, these are all athletes that are using trainer road to warm up before their events. There are more that use it. And it's funny because like you said, Nate, we don't sponsor pro athletes. Thanks Maxine for, for sharing the images. Um, we don't sponsor pro athletes. We know pro athletes use trainer road, but we also are very, uh, we have like a no snooping policy. Like it's not like Nate and Amber and Ivy and I look around and spend all day looking at people's data. That would not be, uh, that would not be unethical. Yeah, exactly. It would be unethical. So we don't do that. Um, and we also especially, don't want to. John, I'm interrupting you, but especially then what if we snooped and then said it, that's even yeah. more unethical about it. But when these people post like they're in public and people post on Instagram, sometimes even their team posts it on Instagram. Uh, yep. We should just start saying it when it happens. So in short, if you're using trainer road, you're in great company, the company of world champions. Um, <laughs> and it's pretty darn cool. Uh, there's a whole, there's a reason why they use it. It's darn good. It's pretty exciting uh, stuff. I feel like cool. some people might get a call and say, you can't use it anymore <laughs> after this. <laughs> yeah. But two, yeah, it's, we'll uh, see. yeah. So anyways, well, if you see like cloaks it. put over like a device, like a laptop or an iPad in front of a person when they're warming up, you'll know why. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, okay. The other thing I want to talk about is the future host challenges. So different events that we could do. We've done a 40 KTT challenge, Nate. Man, that one didn't go well for you. Gosh darn it. A lot it. of these didn't Bolts. go well for yeah, me. Yeah, a lot of them haven't gone well. Cape Epic <laughs> didn't go well. Single Track 6 didn't go well. Um, oh, 
We've had a lot of them. Um, but single track six didn't go well for anybody. Let's be clear on that one. So, but we've done a lot for, of different ones. For those who don't know, day one, I broke my frame somehow <laughs> yeah. on single yeah. track six. It was a small break, but it was also very scary for me. So I was happy that it broke. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of events that we want to do with this crew. Nate, you're going to be on the podcast more regularly now. We might even get Chad back weekly which is exciting. Um, no, uh, Chad and I back weekly next week. I do. I'm traveling for something. So I might not be yeah. on, but after that, as much as possible, Chad and I on as much as possible. It's fantastic. Um, so here's the so, Chad. people can stop bothering me about it. Here's the Chad. <laughs> yeah. We should just allow Chad to drink some days. <laughs> <laughs> Those are days and we'll have bad internet. I don't know what happens. Somehow it all cut out. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, okay. So, I want to run through some lists on some events that we could do. So uh, there's Stetna's Pay Dirt. That one's coming up real soon, but I think registration is already full. But I'm going to do that one. So if you're doing that one, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. There's also Tahoe Trail 100. Ivy, you and I are talking about this. We want to do the co the co-ed duo where we do a relay because it's two laps. So, so fun. It's, yeah, it's going to be 32 miles each lap. Nate has done the 100 or the 100K. I've done the 100K before. We've talked about it on the podcast. Um, but I think we should do the co-ed duo. Uh, what, why, what bike would you ride for that, by the way? Because you always ride cross, typically. Yeah, I think uh, learning about the course, um, I'm going to ride my hardtail 29er as a dropper. And I ride like 2.2s or 2.3s or something. Yeah. Sounds perfect for that course. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. Non-technical course. So Ivy and I are going to do that one. That's coming up this year. That's going to be fun. Wait, uh, we, that, I, there's, the, there's more drama on this. You know who usually wins that? The co-ed? Uh -oh. Levi you know Leifheimer. And, and his, partner. his girlfriend. Yeah, or yeah, yeah his partner. Uh, X, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is... Uh, there's last year, different story. Lots of fast teams showed up. So, mm. and Levi didn't do it. So it'll be fun. I'm looking forward okay. to it. Are you going to do first lap or second lap, Ivy? Uh, I'm going to do second lap so I can like drink a hundred coffees and just chill out mm -hmm. while you're out there in the cold <laughs> in the morning. If that's okay. That's good... <laughs> Ivy, how aggressive are you in a mountain bike race? Um, not very, not very good at it, man. I'm going to try real hard. Uh, I feel like you, you're selling yourself short here. Like you got sharp elbows. You ride with your elbows <laughs> out. Yeah. You don't take that's stuff. Okay. What's yeah. your watt KG, Ivy? Oh, I'm over four now. Dope. Uh, Ripping. Yes. Yeah. So in, uh, in, I'm sure you're much more aggressive than most people, but I'm, what I'm thinking of is relative to John, John's pretty aggressive. Like John doesn't take anything, <laughs> but this also starts with a really long climb and I'm talking strategy for a two lap race. So in a two lap race, uh, especially with this one, there's a long climb and then there's a single track set single track section. And many times you can get stuck behind people who went really hard on the climb and then they're gassed and you're stuck behind them and single track and be hard to pass. Um, the nice part is because John is, is so fit, there'll be less people and John, you're closer to five Watts, right? At sea level. Yeah. 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 Oh, at sea so, level, I'd be over five. Okay. So having that is there'll be less people at the front of the race, therefore less chance to get stuck behind people. But then on the second lap, you're almost by yourself. Like there'll be, there'll be people here or there and John will go so fast. Ivy, you'll be able to, uh, have a lot of just clear road and just descend open without being stuck behind people. That's another one too, is you could be like your Watt KG would be similar to mine. You could be stuck behind me on ascent, which your skills are obviously way higher than mine, Ivy shreds which would not descends. be cool. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this strategy of having John go, go first with, I mean, a little higher Watt KG, but also John is extremely aggressive passing people on. He's still, John, when I say aggressive, he's still safe on it, but John will like go through the bushes and stuff where I wouldn't go through the bushes or not through bushes. You know what I mean? John just yeah. takes every advantage possible where I wait yes. till like the single track ends. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, you can become a little bit faster. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be a fun one. I really want to do one where actually we, we aren't on the same team IV and it's me and Amber and you and Chad. How close would that race be? I have no clue how to score that one. <laughs> uh, right? Actually, you and Amber probably. And that's not because of Ivy, that's because of Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Chad's not here. We can flame him all we want, right? Yeah. No, I can flame it's him while he's here too. That, that's true. Good point. <laughs> okay. Other events. Uh, if anybody's interested in these, let me know. So uh, Rooted Vermont. 
I would like to I'll do that there. one. That's your home. I mean, that? That's like your home race kind of, right? Yeah. I'll be doing the women's clinic in June as well as the event itself. Sweet. And that's yeah, hosted yeah. by the Kings, uh, friends of the podcast. Great people. Canada um, fan. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chad said he was interested in triple bypass, which is like a three big climb race in Colorado, Fondo sort of a thing. So we could do that one. There's Peaks Challenge. Nate, you talked about that one in Australia. That that one looks super hard. Um, that would be a long travel. Three peaks. Um, but pretty cool. We it's have like, a lot of listeners and a lot of athletes in Australia. It'd be cool to see them. So that'd be super fun. It's like a three, it's like a nine, sorry, not three, nine hour day. Yeah. Big day. Yeah. Big day. Really big climbs. It was, John, it'd be great to see you in the front group. I don't think you're not strong enough to win it. No offense. But oh, definitely you, like, not. There's crazy, crazy like continental pros there are doing it but oh yeah that would be still fun to see you race that hard you know since um since i've been doing tri training sorry everybody uh cover your ears like this <laughs> but my body composition is shifting like really favorably um it's really changing a lot so i think that at, and it's strange like my fitness on the bike i'm doing less on the bike but i am matching prs with season match i'm matching prs from last year um which is pretty cool but i'm lighter than i was so and what, I'm what's actually your like getting difference? chest and shoulders and stuff. It's like weird. Dude, Swimming. I wasn't going to be weird, but I was like, damn, John, like, is he doing like push ups? What's the deal? Getting swole. <laughs> <laughs> Swimming, man. And it turns out when you're fighting for your life, <laughs> you swim hard. <laughs> so, Survival yeah. my muscles. <laughs> yeah. John also has a history of uh, motocross where he did have a really strong upper body. So it's easier yeah. for him to get back to that. And his body just, well, you know, more than if he was never there. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, I'm shedding, I'm shedding fat. Basically. Um, I can tell from, I'm not stepping on a scale because I've just, in fact, we're, we're, we like put our scale away at our house. Uh, it's, it wasn't a healthy thing. So, but I'm just from the pinch test, from the comfort test, everything else, shedding body fat from it. So, um, anyways, we have other ones, uh, there's un there's unbound. Does anybody want to do unbound? No. For everybody listening to this, I don't want to discourage you if you're doing Unbound. But sorry, I personally, no, sorry, no hate. It's just yeah, yeah. No zero zero <laughs> desire on my end um, to do that one. I think it's a super admirable thing to take on and a huge challenge and like uh, yeah, massive respect. But it's not personally interesting. High Cascades 100. It's like a mountain bike marathon race in Oregon in Bend area. Mm. That could be a good one. <clears throat> Swiss Epic. Yes please. I cannot wait to do that someday. That would be amazing. Um, same company as Cape Epic. I hear the climbs are even steeper though. So I better be real light for that one. Uh, I do want to go back to single track six. I'm registered for it this year, but we'll have a baby that will be like three weeks old by the time that race is happening. So oh. definitely not doing it. Um, so organizers, I need to contact you on that one <laughs> to see if I can defer. Um, we could do another 40 KTT and we could go to that New Mexico location. That's supposed to be the fastest course. Amber, <laughs> grimacing not looking for yeah. to 40k <laughs> no no that's uh that's not high on my list <laughs> it's super high on chad's chad chad really wants to do it nate would you because a lot of these things too nate you're focusing on the company right now also you aren't eager to go out and do a dangerous mountain biking event or anything like that anymore um would you be interested in a 40k tt to where it is i have like some goals right now with trainer road that i want to like everything mm -hmm. I said, I really want to focus on getting those out, but yes, I would do, uh, a TT again, especially with some, I forgot what brand bike is, but there's some brand bike out there. I'm like, Ooh, that would actually fit me really well, mm -hmm. uh, to make it more comfortable. But yes, I would definitely do a 40 K TT and have a pro mechanic, tighten everything, check everything, build my bike, uh, not cool. do it myself <laughs> <laughs> like that learning from the past, uh, I'm, the, the I'm other a great idea for host host challenge. What's that? Uh, or something we could do at the company retreat relays, running relays. I was oh going to say beer miles, but not everyone drinks. We That'd did be a beer mile before. Uh, yeah. It was me oh. and Brandon and I drink bubbly water because everybody said it's not the, it's not the alcohol. It's the carbonation. And that'd be worse than a beer. While I did throw up quite a lot, oh. I do not think that, uh, it is easier. I, just don't know how it would be. So yeah. Um, Shane did it too, right? Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> you threw Shane, up too though. Yeah. Shane had everyone throw up? of it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Everyone did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's the only time I think I've beaten Brandon in that. I will ever beat Brandon in a running thing. So I'm going to take it. And I will say that, um, <laughs> that's the only one that I would that. enjoy training for of all of these list of things. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I want to say the, the, I'm, 
Ivy just kind of let the beans out of the bag, but I'm going to say what we do for the company retreats because okay. it's unique. And I think other people, companies should do it. So we are a remote company. Many of us have never met before, right? Uh, especially during COVID. And what remote companies usually do is they have everybody fly into their headquarters and they do dinners and like a rope course and like some classes. We've actually done that where we do rope courses and learning, <laughs> fly them into Reno. What we learned is like, we have, you know, Europe people, uh, South Africans, we have a lot of East coast people. Reno is not a hub city. So you have to fly in. Um, when you fly in, you, uh, there's always another one, right. And it's expensive to fly into Reno. And then the hotels in Reno are also not cheap. So if you look at the amount of money, you get a bunch of people to come into Reno and Reno is good for outdoor stuff, but as like a, a Tahoe is nice too, but Tahoe is even more expensive. It is not the most fun mm. location to bring people to. So instead, what we do are called blind retreats. So we spend the same amount of money, but instead of everyone coming to Reno to meet, what they do is they show up with their passport and they don't know where they're going. And then we have a series of adventures planned for these people uh, to get people to... Um, the whole idea is that after this, you're going to feel closer to your coworkers and be able to have real radical candor conversations that maybe sitting, you know, I used to work at a fortune 500. So you never get this sitting uh, in a cubicle next to each other. So places we've gone before are, um, went to Puerto Vallarta a while ago, and then we went to Lisbon. So Lisbon is a good example, very cheap flights to it. And then the hotels were cheap. The food was cheap. It was actually less expensive than flying people to Reno. Again, I don't know why more companies don't do this, especially if their headquarters are in San Francisco. Hotels could be like $400 a night. Lisbon is like 60 bucks. Uh, right there, you're saving so much money. Uh, and it's super fun. Like, John, you were the only one here. Amber was right before Amber started. I and know. she could, she had, she had a, uh, you had to, you were like teaching a clinic, I think, and you couldn't go. Yeah. 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 But, but it's, everyone loves them. Uh, we're going to do another one in the future. And uh, it's, again, I think it's a, we think a little bit outside the box to have a better experience um, than, than the, the standard one of just let's do rope horses in Reno. Let's have yeah. a fun experience. Oh, so for instance, when we landed in Lisbon, we signed up and we did the amazing race. So we had broke up <laughs> into groups and everyone had uh, a clue. And as the team, they had to go around, work as a team to figure out what that clue was and then go from place to place to place. It was a blast. John, was fun. Me, me, John, and this other team, we were neck and neck. And we oh, were competitive. You're sprinting. Another team. <laughs> I think I ran, I think I ran seven miles. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We have to run. I hold, you don't have, no. <laughs> hold on. There were bird so, scooters. He could ride a bird scooter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people are smart and they're like, they'll take, I don't think we take transportation. Yeah. They'll run a bike or something. One of those, like those cheap ones, uh, a scooter. Another team just went and had Packing tapas. A and like, scooter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They drank yeah. sangria and like sent us pictures. They're like, we're not running. And they just, <laughs> they just <laughs> right there. Uh, but yeah, that's what, so that is what so I've alluded to, to the company retreat. Yep. Yep. Um, if you have ideas for events that we should do, let us know. We also had an idea of doing a point to point thing where Nate is almost like the producer in top gear that finds ways to like throw wrenches in the spokes, so to speak, and gives us challenges along the way, like go to the gas station and build out something that's 120 grams an hour of carbs, but fits this macro profile or like, <laughs> <laughs> or like balance your power to weight ratios and do this climb. It'd be fun if we had like a, that would be funny. Uh, that would be a fun one to do. But if you have ideas on events and things that you want to see the podcast crew here do, let us know, uh, go to, or join us on YouTube and let us know, or go to trainerroad.com slash podcast and submit your questions. And in that same spot, you can let us know what event you want us to do. Let's get into some nutrition questions. Max says, I've been listening to the podcast for a while now. And one thing that I've heard multiple times is quote, don't diet on the bike. Trademark Amber Pierce again. <laughs> uh, what do you guys mean with this exactly? <clears throat> What is your view on someone trying to lose five to eight pounds of body fat? He says, you'd need to be in a caloric deficit to lose that weight. So wouldn't this be dieting? Are there any other methods more advisable? Thanks in advance and love the podcast. Amber, floor is yours. <laughs> um, so I want to <laughs> clarify this. Don't diet on the bike is just to say that um, you need to fuel when you're on the bike. You need to fuel your efforts. And I, th I think it becomes a, a default option for a lot of people to avoid eating on the bike because it's a little bit easier. Your fridge is out of reach. Um, you're out on the road and a lot of folks look to exercise as, you know, part of a, 
an approach to calorie control, right? So they're looking at the exercise as the deficit, um, but it doesn't need to be. And it's a lot more effective if you don't look at riding your bike as a way to create a deficit. So what you really want to do is uh, riding the bike is training stress that's going to trigger specific physiologic adaptations. If you want to get fitter and healthier, you want to make sure that you're optimizing your performance on the bike so that you can optimize the training stress, optimize the adaptations that you're going to get from that. The best way to do that is to fuel your efforts when you're on the bike. So this isn't to say that no one should ever create a caloric deficit ever. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, if you are in a position and you need to create a caloric deficit for some reason, the best way to do that is not by skipping food and fuel on the bike. You want to create that caloric deficit deficit somewhere else in your day. You want to make sure that you're fueling before, during, and after your training. That's super important because you're going to get more out of it and it's going to help. It's just going to help your whole effort be sustainable over the long term. As far as views on someone you try to lose five to eight pounds of body fat, that's a really general question that we can't answer because there's so much context around that that's really, really important. And I think we do get some pushback on this sometimes because we talk a lot about making sure you're fueling, you're fueling adequately on the bike during the day. Um, and that is very, very important. But again, because context comes into this, there are some folks that are in situations where they do need to create a caloric deficit. I think part of our approach and you know, other hosts, please um, comment on this as well, is a little bit because the internet and the socials are very fond of reminding us that, uh, or not reminding us, but, but sending this message that losing weight is always a good idea. And that's absolutely not true. It is a good idea for some people, but again, the context here is so heavily dependent and diet culture can, really create this twisted view of thinking that no matter where you are, if you're lighter, it's better. If you're lighter, it's healthier. And that's not true because where you are matters a lot to determine whether that's a good idea for you. That's going to be healthy for you. So we like to remind people that context is important. And we like to remind people that that default mode isn't necessarily true. So what we like to say is when we're looking at that Watts per kilogram, equation, really focus on the Watts part of that. So if you're fueling your training, eating before, during, and after your rides, hydrating well, uh, making sure that you're getting good nutrition the rest of the day, that is going to set you up to get the best possible adaptations and get the most out of those efforts. And all of those things are going to play into helping your body adapt in the ways that it needs to, to be able to perform the way that you want it to. And that's really where we're coming from with this. Ivy, do you have anything to add to this as well? Yeah, I think I would just, Amber covered so many good points. I think the only thing that I would want to add is the implications of um, what happens after you finish your workout when you're dieting on the bike, which for me mm-hmm. looked like um, like crazy binge eating. And it's apart from like losing weight implications, um, it just meant that I wasn't, I was failing my workouts and not getting the most out of my training and not maximizing my performance and then would get home and continue to not check all the boxes I needed to, because I would just need one enormous meal. Like if you're finishing your workout and it didn't go well, and then you're completely empty at the end of it, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. I have some stuff to say, please Nate. Yeah. One. So Anthony a said this in the chat, does anyone on the call today experience drastic mood swings during the build phase? First four weeks of every build phase brings about moody, bad moods. Thoughts? How do I get past this? One of the, the symptoms of being underfueled is you get mood swings, right? This is what people call hangry. So Anthony, this is something that you should be aware of and anyone dieting should be aware of this, uh, that you could be going a little bit too low or you need to be, uh, um, conscious of what you're, or what you're doing, what your emotions are. Uh, Amber's point. Yes. There's so many people who they are already super light and being lighter actually makes them slower or unhealthy stuff like that. There are also though in America, people might know in the world, there are people who are, uh, their, their body fat is at a, a level that is unhealthy and they might be a cyclist and they could get lower and there's, uh, multiple different ways to figure this out, but, uh, I'll, I'll leave you to, if you think that you're 
if you think that you might be in the unhealthy area, you probably, I mean, not the unhealthy area, the too light area, you probably are right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you talk to your doctor about it and it, all that sort of stuff. But in general, this is what worked for me. Cause I did, I lost seven pounds of body fat in like three months and gained four pounds of muscle. And what I did is I get fuel your workouts. And my secret was go to bed slightly hungry. And this is hard to hit, not hungry enough where it's going to keep me up, but just a teeny bit hungry. Then wake up, I'd eat my breakfast, do my workout, fuel that workout, and then do it again. And it's usually through a little, like some vegetables and stuff during dinner, during two, when you're in this phase to lose weight, um, I really like the idea of doing some weight training, uh, do some compound movements. This will help you, um, maintain muscle mass and that you want to, you'll keep the muscle mass and then, uh, uh, lose more fat. And there are some situations that are extreme where maybe you were like a bodybuilder or something and you want to lose muscle mass too, because you're like, you know, you're five, eight, two forty, real, a little, real low body fat. That's probably not the average one. Uh, third is having like eight to nine hours of sleep. This, there's a crazy study showing that like people in a caloric deficit, if you're cutting yourself short on sleep, that group lost mostly muscle with the same protein intake in the, the group that had, uh, um, enough sleep lost, mostly fat. And you can imagine going through all of this, like, uh, it is hard to lose weight, right? It's not easy. And you go through this and you end up just losing muscle. <laughs> like, darn it. That's the worst thing. Your basal metabolic rate probably goes down. This is how yo-yo stuff happens. You lose the weight. You actually burn less calories, right? And, and being on a caloric deficit for too long can actually burn less calorie or can make it so that during the day, uh, your metabolism isn't as high. And you get into this like bad spiral. Uh, I'll talk about reverse dieting in a second. And then third is having enough adequate protein intake, right? You want enough adequate protein intake when you're in a caloric deficit. And when you're on the bike, to be able to manage all these things, um, it is the, the, the protein you want to be able to hit that. And also your carbohydrates, especially before and during the workout and then, uh, manage your fat is that's the one there. You don't want to, it's really easy to overshoot it to go really high fats and a lot of things, uh, calories that you don't know of. You also do want some fat and there is a minimum amount of fat you want, which is pretty easy. So unless you're doing some extreme, uh, artificial diet, it's usually pretty easy to get your fat, especially if you eat like salmon or, or something, avocado during the day, um, reverse dieting, this can happen. This is, this is a really cool thing. And this can happen if you are in that light phase and you, and you think that, uh, you, so if you're very light, and you're not eating much, what you can do is actually increase your calories, very small, 5,100 per week and raise your metabolic rate and actually like be able to, you, you don't gain weight. You just burn more calories the day. You have more energy during that time. And you can work yourself back up over time, just as other people, like they, they damage it the other way, you can improve it. And, uh, there's, this is such a cool thing that I think people don't talk enough about is actually eating more not gaining weight because you're using that energy throughout the day. And as a cyclist, man, more energy, that's all we need, right? More and more energy. Yeah. So the more food you can take in while you're training, the better. Um, yeah. so if you've, if you found yourself as Amber's point is you've dieted a bunch, you're, you're getting, uh, kind of small, you feel like I'm not eating enough. And if I eat anything, I'm going to get bigger. There's two parts of this too, is sometimes it is glycogen and water weight, you know, for every gram of glycogen yeah. that you hold, you gain two grams of water weight. And what can happen is people being on a low carb diet. They go, I eat, you know, I eat a, some bread and I gain three pounds. It's not because of a body fat increase. It's because your body is depleted of glycogen, which we know you need for cycling. And, uh, it comes in and, uh, you gain the water weight. And that's really what your true weight is or what the rate you should be for racing. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of that too, is, um, some of these small fluctuations are, mm, it's, it's because of that. I like the idea yeah, of John natural. where you don't, yeah, you don't have the, the scale, maybe every three months you check in through like, um, I like little, like little calipers on my stomach. That gives me a good, uh, point if I'm going up or down, I did the DEXA before that's really accurate. Uh, but yeah, that's the, mm -hmm. that's, that's how I like also to do checking in on how you feel. I mean, if you're feeling Super like important. you can nail your effort, you can nail your workouts. Feel like it's good. I mean, that's, um, you know, those, those are the real big important markers to be paying attention to. Yeah. You look like you're going to say something. Oh, um, 
to Nate's point, that's why this is kind of a hard topic for me to contribute because I cannot, like I accidentally dieted on the bike for years and there's no circumstance under which, like, I still, I still don't think I eat enough. Like I like fight for my life to eat enough every day before workouts. Like this is, it's hard for me to know how to advise some, and Mm -hmm. I'm the kind of person that doesn't have a scale and like something like calipers would like wreck me. So like my measure is like, I've, how do my pants fit? And like, when I, I, I don't, I don't want to lose weight. So this is, it's hard for me. Like we need to, we need a fuel to perform well. Um, so it's hard for me to contribute constructively. Yeah. Amber's, uh, internet just cut out. I'm sure she'll be rejoining hopefully soon. That's a, re- that's the, the key takeaway here is that everybody does have to approach the weight loss thing independently and, uh, do it with a system of checks and balances. If you are fortunate enough to have a person that you can involve in your life to that degree, it can be great to just get a sanity check by them. Uh, so then they can, because it's really easy to get a distorted perspective on where you should be and where you are, and it can spiral out of control really quickly. So the, but boy, I I really like wrapping it back to what Amber said, when we're saying don't diet on the bike, it's about making sure that you don't look at your training as a way to create a deficit. Instead, you look at your training as something to fuel and that enables your body to do more incredible things. And then outside of it, and honestly, if you, uh, we've talked about this before and we're not gonna have time to get to Jeffrey's question, which is about quality calories. But if you focus on filling your day with quality calories, it's, it can be pretty hard even to hit like a, a caloric surplus because a giant bowl of vegetables really isn't that much, right? Um, and it's when you start bringing in more, and I'll say, uh, I won't call them unhealthy foods, but instead I'll call them foods that don't give us the benefit that we need to have, Oreos and all that other stuff. And you start bringing in the ones that are the easy gets, the binge foods that we just jump in on when we are in a, when we've deprived ourselves, that's when it's really tough to be able to fuel yourself adequately and fuel yourself in a healthy way. So if you really shoot for health and, and, and try a a broad variety of foods and try to keep them to whole foods instead of processed foods and everything else, if you do that, boy, it's so much of it takes care of yourself. And you know, one thing that I've been telling myself over the past uh, year now is that as long as I prioritize my health and then I prioritize my training from a fueling perspective, my body composition will be what it needs to be. Like it will become what it is. And that's what it is. I don't need to be something else. It will just become what it needs to be as long as I'm prioritizing the right things. Cause we really do get the cart ahead of the horse because we look at appearance or we look at a number or we do something like that when we talk about weight. So my body composition will be what it needs to be uh, when I prioritize the right things. I want to say one thing about that. I, I personally like the, the word quality food. I, I don't like, cause it mm-hmm. can lead to, uh, like disordered eating. What I, sure. I like is the idea of saying, um, to your point is, so on the bike, we're doing tech food, right? It's like, we want mm-hmm. that glucose spike. We're doing sugar, all that, all, all of that Cheetos. off the bike. Cheetos, <laughs> Cheetos. That, that's actually Cheetos is kind of higher fat too. And that might not be as good a fuel on a shorter, more intense ride than other ones. I know it's kind of a joke, but I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> then, then, then afterwards too, but in normal life, a, a good rule of thumb is the majority, not all the majority, cause it's fine to eat Oreos and stuff. Uh, just not as your main diet is have your carbs wrapped in fiber. So that if you, if you live by that, it is, it's really hard to make wrong choices and fiber. There's so much good stuff about fiber, uh, with your gut. Um, your health, uh, cancer prevention, uh, society, 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 um, how full you are. Satiety. Satiety. I can't, I don't know why I'm on the podcast. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But so wrapped in fiber means uh, fruit that are carbs wrapped in fiber, like berries, lots of fiber, apples, even bananas are wrapped in fiber. Um, Vegetables, those are all carbs with fiber around it. And it acts a little bit differently in your body in terms of uh, um, long-term health outcomes, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the most important part of this is long-term health outcomes of the things that are wrapped in fiber are also nutritious for you. Uh, oatmeal, right. That has, uh, fiber in it, brown rice, um, all the whole grain pasta, whole, 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 uh, grain bread, um, all those sure. sorts of things. So if you follow that rule of thumb for the majority of stuff, you're pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. and then you can also, you can have dessert sometimes and do some Oreos and 
Uh, yeah. I definitely steal a cookie. Do you do the parent tax ever, John? We were like, oh, <laughs> yes. parent tax, you need some ice cream uh, <laughs> yeah. from their stuff. Exactly. And then regret it because we're lactose intolerant. Uh, okay. And inflation's going up. Sometimes I take more. That's what yeah. happens. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, it, boy, we, it, because we can measure so much on the power and the output side, it can become really tempting to measure everything else to the nth degree. And for some people that might be beneficial and sustainable. So I don't want to vilify that. That might be what you need and what works for you. Um, but it's very different and very individual. Um, great actionable tips on nutrition. Uh, thanks y'all for, for joining us. Amber, sorry, you couldn't finish it off with us. If you're listening to this podcast, Hi, biggest thing you can do to help us is share this podcast with other people and share trainer road with other people. If all of you listening to this, just make an effort to do that with one person this week. Oh, we'd be forever. in uh, Nate will continue to do his hair. Awesome. Like that for you every week. If you do that. So, um, posting. So sp other specific ways are sharing your rides on Instagram or uh, uh, Facebook, take a screenshot, put it up there, or there's a button inside the mobile app to be able to do it. That is wonderful. Um, syncing Strava, telling somebody that you're racing with that you got uh, faster, sharing your story. We hear stories all the time that are shared and uh, we share them, but it would be great if you shared them with your own little little groups because we don't have a huge marketing budget. This is, That's this it. is most of it right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's make the world a faster place. That's how we do it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye everyone.